I hope you can we can hear us here. Thank you very much for joining IH Police Smart Cities Week 2022. Uh, this is the first edition of global celebration of Smart City Vision and the place and moment we are thinking about uh, how we can. I apologize for technical technical issue. So uh, actually, uh, we will try to discuss how we can engage technologies to resolve uh, modern uh, urban challenges. But we will also try to think about uh, how to think out of box uh, in this in this um, challenging actually this problem of urban living because smart cities is not only about technologies it's something much more and bigger and we will try today to demystify the real meaning of smart in our cities uh, personally i also uh, had a wrong opinion that uh, for smart cities is enough just to launch a bunch of different technologies uh, billions of sensors in different places to collect just collect the data and I, I was pretty sure that it's enough to, to collect all uh, necessary knowledge about uh, urban living and uh, to meet expectation of, of uh, urban dwellers in 21st century. But actually, uh, the times of pandemics uh, actually, uh, actually trained uh, and, and directed uh, experts from different fields, including engineering experts, to start thinking a little bit out of box in, in, in that sense. Because uh, we, we actually realize that uh, uh, meeting expectations uh, for, uh, uh, let's say, uh, for our citizens and uh, what they expect for quality of life in 21st century is not only related to, to, to technology solutions. Uh, technology solutions are, uh, simply uh, let's say tool in our hands but also we we should be trained to use these tools uh, to 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 uh, meet expectations and to resolve our challenges uh, now today uh, I, will, I will i will make a, a let's say introduction uh, lecture and try to 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 uh, explain uh, uh, I will try to demystify uh, meaning of smart, and then my colleagues uh, will uh, actually uh, bring uh, different points of view with more technology uh, side, how we can uh, fulfill actually the gaps we have in, in, in urban areas. Uh, let me share uh, my presentation right now, and then uh, we'll start discussing uh, about, about smart smart cities. Actually, why I choose the name, uh, the mystifying the smart cities is not only about cities, actually. Uh, I witnessed also the using the, the prefix smart uh, around the world in different contexts. Uh, smart cities, smart grid, uh, smart whatever, but in many times, I find that actually the meaning of smart is not defined in a proper way. 
Uh, the reason is probably marketing, because if you want to, to promote your work or your product, it's, it's easy to add this practice smart. But also uh, we need to understand uh, the difference between digitalization and digital transformation. We, le le we have to uh, uh, make difference between uh, industry 3.0 and industry uh, 4.0. And actually, to 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 uh, find the border between uh, pure automatization and, for example, smart factories, uh, somewhere behind uh, that uh, terms we usually use in technology walls, Actually, we can find the answer of what really smart means in general, and then we can, in proper way, apply smart in the context of 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 cities. Uh, why we are doing this uh, this Smart City Week? Uh, this is the first edition. This is the first time actually the global uh, engineering community around the IEEE, this two of uh, electrical and electronic engineers around the world actually working on this kind of event. And this is not this is not easy topic. And actually, we involve the uh, different societies to try to help us. We need to discuss with the uh, communication engineers, with software engineers, uh, power engineering. Uh, uh, community also is also important for understanding, for example, of smart grids and renewable sources. Uh, cities uh, are in general very complex systems, and we can define cities in general without any involvement of technology. We can define as a system of subsystems. Uh, there are a set of different services uh, we are using in cities every day. For example, uh, public transportation, waste management. Uh, a water supply, uh, sanitation system, uh, and many others. And in, in, in today's uh, world, actually, we also sometimes, especially in developed countries, we, 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 we think that uh, uh, all these systems are here forever and since I don't know when. But also behind uh, all these discussions, uh, we need to understand that many engineers uh, were working on that, that you just uh, can go and throw your garbage and waste management system in your cities actually take care about that. Uh, uh, the basic idea uh, of this uh, uh, event series we are celebrating this week is to learn how we can engage technologies to help improving quality of life and urban living experience in very different contexts around the world. More than 30 uh, different events are running right now and in following days across Asia, Europe, uh, America, and different kinds of worlds. And in each part of the world, actually, we have pretty different uh, context uh, and meaning of smart for these cities. Also, this perspective of smart is very strange, uh, very changed uh, in this post-pandemic uh, times. Uh, also, if you visit uh, IG Police Smart Cities uh, website, you can you can find the schedule of uh, event series and you can find uh, many events uh, organized by uh, my colleagues, IG Police Smart Cities ambassadors. And we are trying to spread the word uh, about uh, smart cities and importance of smart cities uh, in today's world. Uh, what is actually the mission and vision of, of uh, this, uh, let's say, initiative uh, and why some of you uh, who uh, are following us in this moment actually should join? Uh, we are trying to bring uh, uh, technical societies and organizations inside IEEE, but also involving uh, some other groups uh, outside of IEEE and maybe outside of engineering community to, to help us to... Uh, engage technologies to find how we can uh, use this tool uh, for benefit of society and to meet the global expectation and global standards uh, uh, for high quality living in 21st century. <clears throat> Maybe the sum of sentences already said sounds like uh, some kind of phrases uh, uh, which repeating uh, every day, but actually, uh, more than 50% of all, for example, uh, doesn't have stable uh, water supply and 
at, at their homes. So uh, in that context, actually, we need to find uh, not only how, but we need to optimize our technology usage uh, to make these uh, solutions cheaper and available uh, uh, for uh, non-developed countries to try to, to uh, apply these solutions there. Also, in, uh, in uh, bigger and higher developed countries, also we have a problem that uh, we are using our resources in non-optimal way. Um, actually, sometimes we are thinking that uh, we don't need to care. We don't need to take care about uh, power and energy. We don't need to take care about I don't know public transportation. Doesn't matter if, for example, bus is running uh, around the city almost empty, and I don't know a few hours later you have uh, overcrowded uh, public transportation vehicles, for example. And nobody trying to track that, and nobody trying to the design planning of public transportation. We have a fixed systems based on some uh, collected data, but we don't have any information, for example, uh, uh, in real time, uh, what actually means that we cannot react properly uh, in, in the case of, of, of uh, necessity to, to, for example, improve or decrease the number of vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. This is just a simple example trying to, 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 to help people outside of engineering community to understand what is behind. Uh, I police smart cities identify and food develops technical best practices uh, across the following functional and application domains within the context of urban infrastructure system. Uh, this is just short uh, mission and vision and short introduction to, to today's event. Uh, and I will just jump to, to, to the main part, what is actually important for us to try to understand what uh, SMART really means and how SMART becomes the tech buzzwords. Uh, we are using, so, uh, let's say more often that it is really necessary and actually even more worse, uh, uh, even when it's not really true. Uh, in this, that case, uh, we need to understand, for example, the difference uh, between a uh, few uh, terms we are using. For example, first example is uh, digitalization and digital transformation. For 90% of people, these two terms actually mean the same. But digitalization is actually uh, the pure application of, of uh, information communication technologies in different purposes. You can install a lot of softwares uh, in your working organization or your university. and in, you you can say that actually you digitalize actually your uh, your system, but uh, on the other hand, uh, you still have a lot of papers behind. You still have to uh, manually take uh, your uh, data from one software and to type into another software if it's necessary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Digital transformation is a much broader uh, term. The point is, is not to, uh, digital transformation includes and is founded on uh, on digitalization, but is, it is not enough. Actually, digital transformation asks uh, the community people to also uh, transform themselves into smart, let's say, people uh, in the way that we need to change the, our behavior, uh, our culture, and our expectations. For example, we need to, to respect our workers. And if it's necessary, if, if, if it's possible to redesign our softwares to uh, that two softwares actually changing data between each other to share some information, to share um, conclusions. If you are talking about, for example, artificial intelligence uh, running softwares, then actually softwares can communicate and exchange some uh, important facts and help each other to decide and to optimize some uh, business processes. Uh, digital transformations uh, actually means new business models, new tasks for your uh, human employees and try to, to uh, move and push some tasks, especially uh, uh, repeating tasks from people to machines uh, in, in simple way actually that means that we can uh, optimize our hu human uh, resource usage uh, to um, uh, enable people to work uh, in some uh, creative uh, and uh, innovative jobs and actually some simple tasks could be uh, uh, 
pushed to machines. Um, a lot of people around the world actually talking uh, today about automatized vehicles, self-driving cars, for example. Uh, this is pretty simple task. And in some perspective, if we reach uh, some standards uh, about security, actually it's not so complicated to create some kind of robot who is able actually to, to uh, transport us from one point to another point using available technologies like uh, GPS, global positioning systems, uh, a set of sensors to observe uh, environment, and actually to do the same thing actually we are doing uh, in the situation when actually we have a human driver. Uh, human driver also using our uh, natural sensing to observe environment and using our orientation and changing position from point A to point B. Uh, now, uh, another point I want to discuss today is uh, automatization and robotization in the pure meaning versus uh, modern cyber physical systems. Uh, we also can uh, discuss this and feel what is actually difference uh, because if you talk about pure robotization in, 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 in factories, in, in, in massive industry, let's say, you programmed your machines to do tasks, for example, just simple task to move some objects from point A to point B, and your robot's actually doing that. Doesn't matter what's happening around, your robot will do that task, for example, every 10 seconds or, or every 60 seconds. Um, even in the situation that, for example, uh, worker are close to robot or Unfortunately, for example, a situation that the worker is standing in the path of robot, what is actually very dangerous, your robot will continue doing the task you program them for. And your robots are just doing that. It's just repeating the same action every time frame you, which is actually already predefined. And there is no interaction between your robots and environment. In cyber physical systems, your robots actually acting like human beings. They're, they uh, remember uh, their tasks and doing these tasks uh, in time, but also they're observing environment in real time. In case that something is changed, for example, you have obstacle, your robot will stop doing that or your robot will try to avoid these obstacles or more obstacles, or at the end, it is not possible to avoid this obstacle. Your robot can decide to stop doing that for minute five, ten, or wait for your explicit command. Uh, I hope that you can feel actually what is the difference between the pure robotization and auto automatization and smart uh, robotization and automatization. Uh, also, there is a lot of stories behind that. We can discuss about robot-to-robot uh, -robot collaboration, uh, human-to-robot collaboration, and different kinds of, of smart functions we are expecting that the factories in the future will have. And in this context, also, we are moving from industry 3.0 to industry 4.0. And an end of story. I hope that you can feel what is the difference between uh, Regular cities and cities full of technologies, full of sensors, and the moment that actually our cities become smart, the moment when our cities can self-regulate and self-optimize based on collected data, we can step in the space of real smart. And this is actually something uh, what is very important to understand and to remember and to keep us ambitious to improve our solutions, to really convert them from conventional ones to, to smart ones. Otherwise, if you just install smart bench without with some sensors, maybe with uh, some electronic parts, it looks very fancy and it looks modern, maybe sustainable, maybe green and environment friendly, but without data analyze and self 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 uh, training of the system to change and to react if something is, from the environment is changed actually we cannot discuss about real smart uh, 
to, as, as I said, today we will try to demystify from different sides. I will also talk not only about engineering, I will talk a little bit about regulation, legislation, policy making, and important of, of, of uh, changing the business the business uh, side of, of, of thinking and how, how we can be sure that investment in smart cities is uh, sustainable uh, with no risk or low risk uh, return of investment. And my colleagues will discuss about uh, two important uh, part of, of, of smart cities. Uh, Professor Vukovatovic will talk about 5G and also he will discuss uh, what is going behind in 6Gs and what we are expecting for mobile networks because we are expecting some kind of revolution. 5G is the first uh, mobile network system uh, which is not designed to fulfill uh, human-centric services like calls of, or internet access. 5G and later 6G will be mostly focused how to fulfill uh, expectation for machine-to-machine -machine communication, real-time communications for some specific uh, application, like, for example, uh, self-driving cars and necessity for vehicle-to-vehicle, -vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure and different kinds of communications, which... Uh, must be ultra low latency and uh, very reliable uh, because actually human lives depending on that. Uh, my colleague Alexander George Twins will also discuss about importance of data and he will actually uh, underline uh, something what I already said in this introduction. Uh, when we collect data and when we transport data using modern uh, mobile systems, we need to store uh, segment uh, our collected data and to run different uh, advanced uh, mathematical operations and algorithms to find some uh, cross correlations, correlations, uh, dependency between some events inside uh, using artificial intelligence, machine learning, or as the highest level of this story, deep learning. Uh, why we are discussing smart cities? We are discussing smart cities because uh, we have a lot of challenges to, to resolve around the world. Uh, as I already said, uh, maybe in Europe and people from the United States are not aware that 50% of global population uh, still suffering because no, power, no, uh, no water supply, no sanitation, etc., etc. So we have to find a way and try to design technology solutions uh, to deploy cheap uh, products uh, and to help uh, the citizens in some specific parts of the world to resolve their issues and to actually to help them to meet uh, expectation for quality of life for 21st century. Uh, United Nations discussing uh, discussing uh, these issues and actually uh, United Nations Agenda 2030 uh, defined 17 uh, fundamental goals, very famous as sustainable development goals. We need to 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 uh, to face to 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 discuss to to find a way how we can uh, actually fulfill all of these goals without exception. And any of them are really necessary to uh, finalize this vision of better living uh, globally. Uh, you can see here, no poverty, zero hunger, uh, well-being, uh, quality education, et cetera, et cetera. And SDG 11 is specific. It's, it actually treats urban living and cities uh, a specific focus. And it's very important to understand that uh, we are living in the period of accelerated urbanization. More and more people moving from suburban and rural areas to cities, and some of cities around the world actually uh, becomes incredibly huge. Uh, uh, in 2050, we are expecting that at least 10 cities around the world will be bigger than 50 million people. With so high density of of, of uh, inhabitants in the sm relatively small areas, it's very difficult in technical and any other way to manage plan, infrastructure, and services to provide quality of service we are expecting. Uh, in that case, we really need to, to ask technologies for help. We need to engage some specific solutions. For example, we have issues with uh, power supply. Uh, it's, not, it's not easy to find enough uh, uh, 
healthy water for our people. But also we can install some sensors to check consumptions in different periods of time, uh, during the day, during the week, during the year. We also can identify uh, if we are losing water because uh, because uh, wrong uh, or, or, or actually damaged infrastructure. It's very, very important uh, to try to optimize limited resources we are using in that case. And this is something what actually smart cities uh, should, uh, what is actually the uh, fundament, fundamental for establishing real smart cities. Uh, as you can see on this slide, for example, make cities and human settlement inclusive, safe, resilient, sustainable is actually uh, the basic uh, uh, four direction we want to, to discuss and to find uh, the way. Actually, when I'm talking about these directions and trying to inspire every single person, engineer or not, to start thinking how each of us can contribute to improve our, our cities and our urban areas and make the whole community, global community, one step closer uh, to... Um, quality of life and our expectation, as I said, uh, what we already defined as goals in 21st century. Uh, while we are discussing uh, cities, yes, discussing cities, I said, because we are living in the, in the period of rise of digital citizens and uh, expectations uh, for quality of services pushing people to move from rural and suburban areas uh, to cities. And this process uh, of urbanization uh, it's not slowing down at all. Actually, uh, it becomes more and more accelerated every day. And if you just uh, think about some uh, United Nations official data, for example, in 1950, just 30% of global population lived in cities. In 2030, we are expecting uh, almost uh, two thirds of world population, almost 70% of people will live, uh, will, uh, will live in, 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 in urban areas. Uh, also, if we compare the size of the global economy, uh, in uh, 1950, just the, the global economy was uh, on the level of a three uh, trillion uh, US dollars uh, per year. Now we are talking about 90 trillion US dollars per year. And almost 80% of total uh, economy and production and value uh, is productive in urban areas across across the world. Um, but urban areas, uh, what actually last pandemic uh, proved, uh, suffered about, uh, on many different challenges. For example, we still have a problem how to end the poverty in cities, especially in some uh, world famous uh, uh, cities. Uh, you, we have a lot of uh, homeless people, we have a lot of poverty. Uh, cities are very expensive for living, especially some of them. Uh, we also didn't plan cities uh, to be uh, based on inclusive development. Uh, uh, we are very sensitive to uh, different uh, natural hazards and situations like pandemics, earthquakes, uh, floods. Uh, we didn't think how to reduce uh, disaster risks um, we don't have any production, for example, of food uh, or some basic service in, ur in urban areas. Uh, cities are still very depending on production on rural or eventually some, some urban areas, for example, for food. And uh, what's happened? Uh, today's cities actually uh, create some kind of walls and completely uh, in... in, 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 uh, in a, no natural way we separated urban and rural areas. We also uh, uh, separated uh, humans from the nature. Uh, and we really need to, to think about how we can engage technologies to help us to, uh, to uh, let's say, uh, keep alive our rural areas to, to bring some uh, um, services, modern services there, for example, healthcare or uh, high quality education, what is actually possible using, for example, internet. We are, today we are discussing uh, this conference and this event in online ways. So uh, if, you are, if you have a, a connection to internet, actually you can follow uh, many education and training programs 
from any point around the world, including the rural and suburban areas. So it's not necessary to move to cities uh, for education. Uh, maybe teleconference based uh, uh, consultation with your doctors can also improve uh, healthcare system and uh, move uh, healthcare system outside of uh, physically connected locations like hospitals and, and uh, uh, other institutions. We're, we're just uh, trying to brainstorm possible ideas and some answers are already just in front of our eyes, but we uh, sometimes we are, I'm thinking that we are not uh, brave enough to push the button to start running some of these services. So this is just the opportunity for innovative uh, people with creative way of thinking to maybe launch some kind of startups or ideas how to actually to create the new services uh, based on already existing technology and solutions. Um, also, we have a lot of uh, different social problems, uh, in, uh, intergeneration issues, uh, gender uh, unbalance, uh, unbalanced gender relations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And when we start discussing about smart cities, we really need uh, to, to discuss smart villages, we need to discuss smart society, and we really need to change uh, our way of thinking and also to try to build smart cities uh, around the smart citizen. Because uh, if we really think that technology can resolve all our problems, and we will discuss that at the end of uh, this talk, we really don't understand technologies nor uh, our problems we face. Uh, let's try to find position of smart cities. Smart cities, uh, as I said, uh, uh, smart cities are very complex systems. Uh, systems of subsystems uh, and um, many other technologies can be involved to support uh, foundation of smart cities. We can discuss, as, as I said already, 5G, virtual reality, robotization, machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data concept. Uh, uh, we can discuss about augmented reality, of course, internet of things and massive uh, sensor deployments. We will try to collect uh, a huge amount of data I uh, will try to check uh, and profile uh, citizen behavior, of course, without uh, attack on individual privacy, but we will try to, to uh, for example, to track uh, some habits of people. Uh, I will just try to share uh, one simple example. Uh, for example, people uh, in, in, in the morning, when people going to, to work, uh, uh, citizens in, in cities traveling from, uh, residential areas to, to business areas of the city. In afternoon, we have uh, the opposite direction of traveling. So when we are planning public transportation, number of vehicles and direction of, 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 of uh, uh, this, these vehicles and probably uh, the exact path of, 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 of driving of these vehicles, actually we need to change some, uh, and to make actually some decisions uh, based on real-time processing and long-term observation of habits of our citizens. And when I say habits, I really think about their needs. Uh, in that case, we can uh, actually spend less money, uh, use maybe less number of vehicles, but also at the same time provide uh, better services, a better quality of services for our citizens in different ways. Uh, public transportation, just one example, we also can apply it and to be innovative in our way of thinking uh, when, when we are discussing about waste management and possibility for recycling and the use of some materials, uh, green and circular, to create a, a green and circular economy friendly environment in our cities, uh, but also decreasing some costs uh, and actually uh, allow us to, to live uh, better in our cities uh, in cheaper way uh, to actually to spend less natural resources. Uh, and it's really important to, to discuss and to find answers how we can engage some specific technology solutions you can see on these slides, for example, to fulfill some expectation or some to resolve some challenges in urban, urban areas. Um, for Smart City Foundation, it's really important to simplify uh, the way of thinking in, in this triangle. I really like this triangle because it, uh, this triangle explains everything. Uh, 
Internet of Things, we can imagine as a bunch of sensors. We can actually install sensors and improve different objects and machines or, or devices with some sensors uh, uh, to check uh, our behavior or to count something and to be some kind of trigger for some reaction, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we can, for example, install sensors to count the number of passengers in, 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 in the vehicles of public transportation systems. We can also check the, 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 the level of garbage in garbage boxes to, to, to properly uh, plan uh, the schedule when a garbage truck will visit some specific part of cities. Uh, we can track whatever we want. We can communicate with the vehicles in the future, what is very close to us. As I said, we already think about vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure communications. Uh, we can track different things and we will collect enormous, uh, unimaginable uh, amount of data. After we collect this kind of data, we need to transport this data from the place when data is collected on some specific location. We need to send uh, on to one or maybe limited number of different distributed locations. For that, we need very strong telecommunication infrastructure. The vision of, of uh, telecommunication technology, which is uh, uh, which has ability to uh, follow these requirements, we are talking for the first time about 5G, and 5G is designed to support machine-to-machine uh, -machine, uh, communication and massive sensor development. We are talking about uh, machine type communication as a central uh, uh, point of discussion for designing of 5G. Of course, all previous, uh, as I already said, all previous uh, uh, technologies, mobile uh, system technologies like uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, uh, were designed to fulfill uh, human-centric services like how voice calls, uh, messaging, or internet access, what uh, becomes the central point of, of, let's say, regular user observation of, of mobile systems. For, uh, starting uh, uh, by uh, 5G and later, actually, the focus would be moved to machine type communication. And at the end of story, when we transfer all this data, we need to store this data somewhere. And we are talking about the big data concept. Uh, we can store all this data on one lo big location or maybe try what is uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, logical to distribute this uh, data to some closer location to the place of, uh, actually place where uh, this, data, uh, uh, this data is collected. And we need to segment this data, to analyze this data, to separate, to, to run some mathematical advanced algorithms and operation between this data, looking for some, uh, added value, some kind of additional knowledge, which is not able to be observed by eyes or by regular human logic. Because I will just try to share again one simple uh, example. Just uh, there is no any sense from uh, perspective of, of how human brain works to find correlation, for example, uh, between uh, the weather and the color of my shirt. But if you check my behavior and if you realize that in 30 situations when the day is sunny, I'm, 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 I'm wearing a white shirt, maybe you can find some correlation. You can maybe predict something. If tomorrow is sunny day, okay, most people will use this number for or this color for for shirts or for some specific individuals. This is maybe completely uh, in practical way an, an useless uh, case, but it's very great for illustration because there is no any sense to check correlation between, between these two facts. Limitation but, uh, for us to, to check on this correlation is based on, our, or on how our brain works and actually on our previous experience. Uh, big data systems will help us uh, to find knowledges which are uh, much beyond our experience, empirical experience, and the way how we observe the world uh, around us. Uh, and actually, this, this is the goal for the whole event. And actually, this triangle uh, we discussed will be focused on discussion also of my colleagues. Uh, they will try to discuss uh, 
uh, 5G and big data, data processing and telecommunication infrastructure necessary for uh, functioning of, of, of smart cities. Um, if you want to uh, actually to convince the governments, uh, uh, companies to invest in smart cities, we really need to create uh, new business models. And we really need to uh, present and uh, create new business models. And we need to prove that actually if we invest technologies, for example, in waste management systems, we can decrease the number of uh, garbage uh, vehicles, garbage collector vehicles, for example, we can uh, make a shorter path for collection. If we have information uh, from the field, actually we can plan our activities day by day and optimize the total usage of available resources. When we talk about resources, we're talking about human resources, financial resources. We have a different constraints we are facing every day. And actually that's the, the reason why uh, quality of services in urban areas suffering, uh, uh, suffering every day almost because we cannot uh, react and resolve uh, in parallel every problem in every moment. We actually sending our vehicles for garbage collection in some, some direction, our public trans transportation vehicles covering some specific lines and routes around the cities. But actually there are many streets without public transportation. Even if uh, there, uh, there is a need for that, for example. Uh, Optimization of, of resource usage is uh, one ultimate goal. And also when we optimize this uh, resource usage, we also can balance. We can take some financial uh, resources from one service and invest to another one to improve uh, some other services which are critically low, for example. And uh, in, that, in that case, in that uh, uh, way, we need to think when we are discussing about smart cities. Also, uh, as I said, the circular green economy is something what is, uh, uh, what is available to be launched together with smart cities because uh, if we collect, for example, garbage and if we uh, enable recycling, uh, recycling, uh, actually that's, that means that we can uh, earn some money for, from that process and we can make this, this service uh, cheaper or completely free from our, for our citizens. Plus we can earn some additional money and invest in some other public needs or services. Uh, collecting data and management to data and establishing open, open data portals, also improving uh, uh, data transparency, uh, we, the government or, or any other institutions uh, responsible for collecting this data can actually open this data to uh, academic community for research, for businesses, to citizens also at on civil society at all. And this is also great for democratization and improvement of, 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 of our society. When, when I said smart cities, I already said uh, smart citizens, but we can also want to create smart society end of story because smart cities are standing around the smart cities and the smart society. Smart city is not the purpose, smart city is just the environment uh, which enables, uh, enables uh, 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 developing of smart society and better better life. Uh, smart cities technology uh, should also help us to create uh, cost-effective and time-efficient uh, services. As I already said, the road driving optimi optimization and many other what is already said. Uh, I will not spend too much time more uh, because my colleague will tell more about technology side, how we can uh, fulfill this, uh, these requirements. I will just uh, share maybe a few few slides uh, about uh, Internet of Things and this evolution. Uh, as you can see, we can actually install sensors uh, in everything. So Internet of Things sometimes is named as Internet of Everything because literally you can install sensors to track uh, animals in, in, in food production systems, in industry, in, in, in urban transportation systems, uh, in wage management system, and also you can you can track, for example, leakage in the water supply systems and to plan uh, some uh, improvements uh, uh, and maintenance in the future. So uh, we already discussed the robotization in smart factories. Uh, manufacturing uh, in, in the modern way will be based, as I said, on human robot and robot-to-robot -robot collaboration uh, based on uh, collected data and uh, sensing of the environment around the uh, the, the, the system. Uh, I, already, I already discussed artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning, and my colleague uh, 
Mr. George will talk a little bit more about the importance of data, but I really want to use this slide to underline uh, importance of data and data processing to establish smart city. Without data processing and data collection, uh, prefix of smart is not really smart, and we discussed in the very beginning of this, this talk. Uh, when we try to sell this idea to outside of our community, engineering community, and maybe some experts from different fields related to, to, to smart cities, uh, we need to expect some kind of resistance because we need to understand that most of people uh, will not understand properly what, why we are doing this and what is actually the final goal. I really try to avoid to use uh, complex engineering uh, terms today in this, this uh, introduction uh, uh, talk. I really try to, to, to sell uh, the idea of smart cities to broader community uh, because engineers, uh, especially electronic engineers, telecommunication engineers, software engineers, even power uh, engineers actually understand more or less importance of uh, the process of establishing smart cities from different perspectives, but they are pretty aware. Uh, experts for regulation, data regulation, privacy, cybersecurity, they are also pretty aware of smart cities, but we really need to convince uh, decision makers in governments. We really need to, to prioritize research and development in academic community also to work more uh, on uh, services and solutions related to smart cities and also to, 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 to let's say, inspire industry and businesses to be more open for smart cities and to invest more money uh, in developing, but also in uh, implementation of some, of some smart services based on already existing technology solutions. To be honest, there are not too many uh, examples around the world uh, uh, which are uh, connected to, to vision of smart cities, but I'm pretty sure that there are strong community behind already aware and we are trying to sell and to explain to demystify the idea of smart cities that we actually in next decade can launch and run many smart city services in different parts of worlds uh, final uh, messages Is, is much more of that. We really want to use the potential of digital technologies and connected, uh, connected devices. And the final goal, the only goal is to improve people's lives, to improve quality of their lives, to improve services, and to improve their uh, way of living so that our uh, people are less frustrated, more happy at the end of the story, really want to create smart and happy society. Uh, final message, as I said, technology is just one side of story, and it's nice, uh, but if you really think that just technology, pure technology can solve your problems, then you don't understand the problems, and you don't understand the technology at all. This is the one sentence I really like to share at the end of my talks. Uh, uh, usually, uh, it's one citation from Bruce Schneier, the world-famous uh, cybersecurity expert. Uh, and this is really important that uh, technology is just a tool in our hands and our responsibility is how to use this technology and actually uh, how we can engage technologies to resolve existing and future challenges we face every day. And this is the uh, uh, end of, of uh, uh, my introduction talk. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, it was interesting uh, and for everybody who wants to know, know more or ask me or my colleagues uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, lectures after, um, I suggest to maybe to write uh, questions. Uh, if you are connected on Zoom, you can write questions here in chat or maybe if you follow us live, you can leave your questions uh, in chats or comments and of course uh, some of us depends uh, which kind of question you send actually we'll, uh, we'll try to answer and to demystify the real meaning of, of smart uh, next uh, next uh, uh, 
lecture will be uh, from Professor Vukobratovic related uh, uh, on importance uh, of uh, 5G for establishing smart city and their foundation. So uh, I will wait for Professor Vukobratovic to, to, uh, to join us if he is not already. In between, actually, I will just uh, share uh, the promotion video of Fight for the Smart Cities Week again. Uh, and we will wait that uh, Professor Kovatovic join us uh, for a second lecture of, of today's event. As cities grow, the pressure over the built space and environment increases, as well as the needs of the population. The complexity of the relations develop in the urban space also demands new forms of managing, planning and living in the cities. IEEE Smart Cities brings together an array of technical societies and organizations to advance the state-of-art of smart cities technologies for the benefit of society by serving as a neutral source of information to industry, academic and government stakeholders. The IEEE Smart Cities community is supported by five IEEE partner societies and one council and they bring their expertise in the field to smart cities applications. We also have many educational activities within IEEE Smart Cities, including activities that count towards continuing education units. The most popular is the IEEE Smart Cities webinar, which counts with high-level technical specialists from many parts of the world, speaking about their findings on the latest trends, technologies and solutions for smart cities. You can find the educational activities and publications in the IEEE Smart Cities Resource Center. In 2014, IEEE Smart Cities implemented a core and affiliated Smart Cities program in an effort to create a community to share best practices, discuss technical topics, and create a vibrant and worldwide grid of cities on the path to smartification. We also have 12 affiliated Smart Cities in four continents. And in the last six years, we have reunited our community at the core cities for the IEEE International Smart Cities Conference. This conference brings together practitioners, city policymakers and administrators, infrastructure operators, industry representatives and researchers to present technologies and applications, share their experiences and points of view about current and future smart city applications. This year, the IEEE International Smart Cities Conference is going virtual. We look forward that you have the best experience wherever you are around the globe. We know that the pandemic restricted our opportunities to get together in person, in conferences and physical events, but we can still reunite through virtual conferences and webinars. To keep up to date with the IEEE Smart Cities community activities, join us in our social media channels on Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. If you haven't joined the IEEE Smart Cities community yet, please access smartcities.ieee.org to learn how. As cities grow, the pressure over the built space and environment increases, as well as the needs of the population. The complexity of the relations develop in the urban space also demands new forms of managing, planning and living in the cities. IEEE Smart Cities brings together an array of technical societies and organizations to advance the state-of-art of smart cities technologies for the benefit of society by serving as a neutral source of information to industry, academic and government stakeholders. 
The IEEE Smart Cities community is supported by five IEEE partner societies and one council, and they bring their expertise in the field to Smart Cities applications. We also have many educational activities within IEEE Smart Cities, including activities that count towards continuing education units. The most popular is the IEEE Smart Cities webinar, which counts with high-level technical specialists from many parts of the world, speaking about their findings on the latest trends, technologies, and solutions for smart cities. You can find the educational activities and publications in the IEEE Smart Cities Resource Center. In 2014, IEEE Smart Cities implemented a core and affiliate smart cities program in an effort to create a community to share best practices, discuss technical topics, and create a vibrant and worldwide grid of cities on the path to smartification. We also have 12 affiliated smart cities in four continents. And in the last six years, we have reunited our community at the core cities for the IEEE International Smart Cities Conference. This conference brings together practitioners, city policymakers and administrators, infrastructure operators, industry representatives, and researchers to present technologies and applications, share their experiences and points of view about current and future smart city applications. This year, the IEEE International Smart Cities Conference is going virtual. We look forward that you have the best experience wherever you are around the globe. We know that the pandemic restricted our opportunities to get together in person, in conferences and physical events, but we can still reunite through virtual conferences and webinars. To keep up to date with the IEEE Smart Cities community activities, join us in our social media channels on Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. If you haven't joined the IEEE Smart Cities community yet, please access smartcities.ieee.org to learn how. the pressure over the built space and environment increases, as well as the needs of the population. The complexity of the relations developed in the urban space also demands new forms of managing, planning and living in the cities. IEEE Smart Cities brings together an array of technical societies and organizations to advance the state-of-art of smart cities technologies for the benefit of society by serving as a neutral source of information to industry, academic and government stakeholders. The IEEE Smart Cities community is supported by five IEEE partner societies and one council and they bring their expertise in the field to smart cities applications. We also have many educational activities within IEEE Smart Cities, including activities that count towards continuing education units. The most popular is the IEEE Smart Cities webinar, which counts with high-level technical specialists from many parts of the world, speaking about their findings on the latest trends, technologies and solutions for smart cities. You can find the educational activities and publications in the IEEE Smart Cities Resource Center. In 2014, IEEE Smart Cities implemented a core and affiliate Smart Cities program in an effort to create a community to share best practices, discuss technical topics, and create a vibrant and worldwide grid of cities on the path to smartification. We also have 12 affiliated Smart Cities in four continents. And in the last six years, we have reunited our community at the core cities for the IEEE International Smart Cities Conference. This conference brings together practitioners, city policymakers and administrators, infrastructure operators, industry representatives and researchers to present technologies and applications, share their experiences and points of view about current and future smart city applications. This year, the IEEE International Smart Cities Conference is going virtual. We look forward that you have the best experience wherever you are around the globe. We know that the pandemic restricted conferences and physical events, but we can still reunite through virtual conferences and webinars. To keep up to date with the IEEE Smart Cities community activities, 
join us in our social media channels on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. If you haven't joined the IEEE Smart Cities community yet, please access smartcities.ieeee.org to learn how. grow, the pressure over the built space and environment increases, as well as the needs of the population. The complexity of the relations developed in the urban space also demands new forms of managing, planning and living in the cities. IEEE Smart Cities brings together an array of technical societies and organizations to advance the state-of-art of smart cities technologies for the benefit of society by serving as a neutral source of information to industry, academic, and government stakeholders. The IEEE Smart Cities community is supported by five IEEE partner societies and one council, and they bring their expertise in the field to smart cities applications. We also have many educational activities within IEEE Smart Cities, including activities that count towards continuing education units. The most popular is the IEEE Smart Cities webinar, which counts with high-level technical specialists from many parts of the world, speaking about their findings on the latest trends, technologies and solutions for smart cities. You can find the educational activities and publications in the IEEE Smart Cities Resource Center. In 2014, IEEE Smart Cities implemented a core and affiliate Smart Cities program in an effort to create a community to share best practices, discuss technical topics, and create a vibrant and worldwide grid of cities on the path to smartification. We also have 12 affiliated Smart Cities in four continents. And in the last six years, we have reunited our community at the core cities for the IEEE International Smart Cities Conference. This conference brings together practitioners, city policymakers and administrators, infrastructure operators, industry representatives and researchers to present technologies and applications, share their experiences and points of view about current and future smart city applications. This year, the IEEE International Smart Cities Conference is going virtual. We look forward that you have the best experience wherever you are around the globe. We know that the pandemic restricted our opportunities to get together in person, in conferences and physical events, but we can still reunite through virtual conferences and webinars. To keep up to date with the IEEE Smart Cities community activities, join us in our social media channels on Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. If you haven't joined the IEEE Smart Cities community yet, please access smartcities.ieeee.org to learn how. As cities grow, the pressure over the built space and environment increases, as well as the needs of the population. The complexity of the relations developed in the urban space also demands new forms of managing, planning and living in the cities. IEEE Smart Cities brings together an array of technical societies and organizations to advance the state-of-art of smart cities Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes. Uh, thank you for joining us. I already shared the basic information, but I didn't want to talk uh, too much, so you can do a short introduction. I'll just uh, remind the audience that uh, Professor Kovratovic is professor at the University of Novi Sad at Faculty of Technical Science. He's also one of, of co-founder of uh, Iconic Center, uh, which is focused on uh, telecommunication solutions, technologies, uh, research work. Uh, 
professor Bratovic is uh, one person who has a specific ability to explain complex problems in very simple, interesting way. And I really hope that the global audience will enjoy in this talk. Uh, in my introduction uh, presentation, I just discussed about uh, foundation triangle of smart cities, uh, Internet of Things, uh, 5G and beyond, uh, telecommunication technologies. And I just introduced that our colleague, uh, Mr. George, will later talk a little bit more about big data component, uh, data analyzing, artificial intelligence, and how we can use this data. But actually, the central problem is how to transport uh, data collected from uh, billions of sensors in urban areas uh, applied in different uh, uh, contexts, let's say, uh, how to, to transfer them to, to big data centers, uh, one of them, or distributed centers. Uh, it's a central problem. So I will not spend your time more. So Professor Kobratovic, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, thanks for the invitation on this nice event. Uh, so I will uh, I will share my screen, but the host will need to let me do that. Just uh, give me a second to find this uh, this option. Okay, it's here. Change host. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so basically, uh, I will go through the slides uh, of the talk, which is entitled 5G, the key enabler for smart cities and IoT. And uh, in our group, in, in Novi Sad, we are very much focused on cellular IoT, which means uh, communication of very large number of devices over cellular networks. And uh, these devices need not um, require some high throughputs or some very short latencies. Uh, they are mainly here to collect uh, occasionally some information from sensors. And then, uh, as Alexander mentioned, to transfer this information to, to some of the storage capacities, uh, whether that is in some cloud centers or, or maybe somewhere closer to the edge. So um, my primary focus will be on uh, the technologies that were introduced maybe last five years or so that uh, somehow extended the capacity of cellular network to support such devices. And the main challenges uh, were that uh, traditional mobile networks, they got used to mobile phones as a principal users. So typical uh, macro base station or macro cellular site was able to accommodate maybe of the orders of tens at most hundreds of mobile phones which are simu simultaneously active. While we are now talking about much higher density of connections, so we expect to have thousands or maybe tens of thousands of devices connected to, to the base station, which is basically something that cellular network was not designed for, was not prepared for this type of traffic. So my presentation was, will be mainly about how 4G and then afterwards 5G evolved to support this type of connectivity. Okay, so I will, uh, I will talk about quick introduction to cellular IoT at the very beginning. And then I will go very personal and I will present what we are doing in our group in this domain. But I think this, this will be, I hope it's one side, it will be interesting. On the other side, it will be sort of an example. What can you do with this type of technologies in smart city or similar applications? Okay, so I will start with this 5G triangle, which is a, a very common uh, picture. Uh, it basically tells you that for evolution from 4G to 5G was not uh, linear in a sense that you didn't just extend the bandwidth and provided more data rate to end users. You did, in fact, through this topmost service, which is called Enhanced Mobile Broadband. But then uh, 5G also had an ambition to broaden the scope of applications and to uh, accommodate not only human type users with their 
mobile phones with some fantastic capabilities and very high data rates, but also to accommodate some other industries. And these two other services are called typically massive machine type communications and ultra reliable and low latency communications. And uh, this was something that was not available in 4G, even remotely. And many uh, new developments, especially at the physical layer of development of 5G technology was necessary to basically create a radio interface that can support these new services. And I already mentioned massive machine type communications. It's all about connection density. So basically making a solution that would accommodate tens of thousands of devices per base station. While ultra reliable and low latency communications is a little bit different, it is more focused on very short delay between the device or as we call user equipment and some service which is somewhere in the network. So for example, for self-driving cars or for some sort of remote, remote surgery applications or something like that, where reliability and low latency is extremely important. Also some industrial applications like uh, connected factories where you operate some robots remotely or maybe you operate drones remotely and so on through the network. But today, because we are in smart city domain, we are mainly interested in massive machine type communications because smart city is a particular environment where you expect to have a lot of sensors that need to communicate occasional and small amount of data to the network. And maybe the principal example is smart metering applications, where you would like to connect uh, traditional metering infrastructure, so power meters, gas meters, water meters, or similar, uh, not to use some conventional technologies that we used before, some of them mostly wired, but to use wireless and very flexible cellular IoT approach. So basically, uh, as I said, our focus is on this part of the triangle, and uh, we would like to consider massive connectivity for billions of devices, for smart city applications, but also smart agricultural applications in the rural areas, smart energy applications across the smart grid environment, whether that is in urban areas like smart meters or in rural areas for some sort of measurement devices and so on and so on. So original requirements in 5G was to increase the density of the connection density of these devices to over a million devices per square kilometer, which is really high density. And uh, as I men mentioned, 4G is already uh, the technology that started in this direction. And this is something that we will talk a lot in the following slides. And this technology in 4G, which is called narrowband IoT, is already capable of you know, meeting almost these requirements. So there will be a relatively small amount of changes of this technology in 5G to be able to meet these requirements. Uh, technologically, this uh, emphasized sentence tells you a lot. So basically, uh, this is very new problem in communications because you typically in cellular communications didn't have to accommodate connection for such a large amount of devices. And as it is written here, it is much easier to allocate one gigabit per second to a single device than one megabit per second to 1000 devices, uh, which is in total obviously the same throughput, but from the perspective of managing these connections, uh, of you know signal signaling that is needed uh, to allocate resources to each individual device it becomes very complex so you know i can just give you an example from you know real world so it's it's it, if you have a teacher in the classroom talking to two or three pupils or if you have the same teacher in some i don't know sport hall talking simultaneously to 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 few hundreds children then you can see, you can feel the difference in complexity. So basically we need to learn how base station talk to many, many, many devices at the same time. And the first step is introduced by 3GPP standardization in so-called the release 13. So it was before 5G was introduced and it is called narrowband IoT and it's still technology that dominates this massive machine type communications. Uh, 
let's say, applications. So I will talk mainly about narrowband IoT. So in 2016, uh, in this release 13, three new standards were introduced, and one of them is NB IoT. Uh, the target was really low rate, uh, low power devices who might be that might be battery operated with battery duration of five to 10 years or something like that. Uh, it was not the only standard that was introduced. Very similar standard was introduced for GSM. So basically to upgrade your 2G network. Although it's a matter of question if this will be very popular, it's mainly for the mobile operators who still don't want to kind of uh, remove their 2G infrastructure and they have long-term plans with 2G infrastructure. Uh, and also additional standard was called enhanced machine type communications. It was later become more popular as LTEM, which is uh, similar to narrowband IoT, but which with a little bit higher throughput and uh, higher capabilities. So maybe if we are talking about tens of kilobits per second or maybe hundreds of kilobits of, per second in, in MB IoT, then in LTEM it can go up to one megabit per second which means that some simpler even video data transmission can be uh, established via LTM. So some sort of security cameras with not so high resolution uh, could be also uh, connected via LTM. So uh, the architecture of the network is very similar to standard 4G and 5G architecture. So basically you have radio access network, which is like a radio network where most of the action takes place. And you have also a core network. This is something that as a users, we typically don't see. It is part of a mobile network operator infrastructure. And uh, of course, we, we are the main element in radio access network is the base station. In 4G, it is called E node B. So this is a common terminology that people use in, in mobile cellular world. And uh, it evolves in, towards 5G into, I mean, again, base station, which is now called G node B. So basically, if you see E node B, this is typically 4G base station. If you see G node B, it's typically 5G base station. And then we want to connect huge number of devices. And devices in, in cellular networks are typically called user equipment. So basically, we now have cellular IoT user equipment. And as you can see, these are not no longer mobile phones. Those are some sort of sensor platforms from which you measure and collect data and then occasionally transmit this data via radio interface to the base station. Okay, so basically the goal is to have this infrastructure and then to connect many tens of thousands of devices to the base station so that they could do their work, they could measure something and send data through the core network to some servers where you might store this data, you might visualize data, do whatever you want with, with this large amount of data. And uh, of course, every of these parts of the system is uh, defined by specific protocols. And I'm just showing this picture to let you know that there is quite a big complexity, you know, with all these protocols that you are typically using to communicate between end device and some application in the cloud. For our purpose and in, in our group, uh, these protocols on the radio link between the device and the base station are the most interesting. So basically, this is something that we are typically focusing on. So basically, how the device is sending you know, some packet of bits over this single hop radio connection to the base station. And to do so, uh, 3GPP as a standardization body defined a particular set of protocols which are necessary for the device and the base station to communicate. And these protocols are now, nowadays, they are typically embedded as a chip or hardware module, which then you can integrate into your device. So for example, the devices like this, I will show them later a little bit in more detail. Uh, we, we use a lot of in-house designed and built devices for this purpose. But anyhow, they have to have this communication module. And uh, in our case, this is the narrowband IoT communication model that you are integrating along with some sensors or microcontroller units or memories to uh, assemble your, your device for IoT applications. 
And then uh, the most interesting part is essentially is this lowermost physical layer part where all the activities related to how to convert bits in your message to signal that will be emitted by your antenna. And then, you know, in our group, we are very much focused on this type of things. Of course, this is a very short talk, so I'm not going to go into any of these details. But uh, this is just to show you that there is quite a significant complexity on what is going on in the device and at the base station so that your block of bits, which are read from some sensor, are reliably transmitted over this wireless link. And uh, again, just to give you a, a sense how this all works, basically your uh, IoT device is typically sleeping most of the time. So uh, in this narrow band IoT standardization, they, of course, they knew they want to have devices that are operating for 10 years with a simple battery. So they needed to basically decrease the power consumption wherever they could. And one of the most powerful way to decrease the power consumption is to put the device to the sleep mode. And this sleep mode is called power saving mode. So this PSM is a part of the time where the device is basically unreachable. So, uh, all the electronic components on the board are either completely turned off or they are working with some essential minima to, to survive. And then um, occasionally, depending how you program your device or depending if there is something from the network side uh, that needs to be transmitted to the device, uh, your device will wake up, do something that I will describe shortly, and then go to sleep again. And this example here is a typical communication uh, setup where your device has to trans wants to transmit a packet of data. So maybe you programmed your device, for example, to measure some temperature or some, some environmental parameter every six hours. So then every six hours, the device will wake up. So once it wakes up, it will first acquire synchronization with the base station. So basically it listens some downlink signals. So downlink are these blue signals from the base station to the device. So basically I'm kind of waking up. I don't know where I am. And then I'm trying to listen base stations around me and trying to recognize the signal of the base station. Uh, after some time, I will be able to do it. When I'm able to do it, I start reading some signals that base station is transmitting periodically. So basically, at this stage, I am synchronized with the base station, and then I'm reading system information. System information is something, again, which is transmitted in the downlink from the base station that tells me, you know, basic parameters of the network. So I can configure my radio device for these parameters. And then I move to one of the major stages of data transmission, which is called the random access stage. This is where I am asking a base station for transmission of one packet. So you can imagine there are tens of thousands of the devices, and it's very hard for the base station to manage all of them. So once you wake up, you need to ask a base station first, something like, excuse me, can you give me specific resources in the uplink where I can transmit my message? So again, this is like, you know, a teacher in the school being asked or seeing some kid raising the hand and one wanting to ask some questions. So this is the same situation. So we are asking the base station for permission to send a packet of data. And then we go to the data transmission phase where we typically transmit block by block of data and base station is occasionally acknowledging some of these blocks. And then after we finish, we are uh, typically awake for a few more time. I'm talking about like milliseconds of time, and then we go to sleep. So this is how it, this is how it typically works. And uh, we are now technologically uh, around the world at the stage where narrowband IoT and LTEM are deployed as the technologies. So they are introduced very late 2016, during 2017 and 18 vendors provided the equipment, they updated base stations of, 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 of 4G LTE network operators and 
typically starting from late 2017, early 2018, the first mobile operators around the world started providing commercial services. And you can say that today in 2022, most of the mobile operators around the world, they do have some sort of cellular IoT connectivity option for you. Mostly this is narrowband IoT. In 5G, uh, it turned out that most of the requirements are already met with narrowband IoT and LTE. So uh, let's say that this technology will be just integrated in 5G. So it will continue its lifetime with very small adjustments and it will become part of 5G. So in that sense, uh, narrowband IoT is very nice because it's not 4G technology, it's technology that started in 4G and it's evolving in 5G, so it is still there. But this is not uh, uh, the final part of the story. Uh, the 5G standardization, they decided to develop a new IoT standard, which they called 5G new radio red cap, reduced capability 5G devices. And it is an ongoing work in the release 17 of standardization, which means this is something that is going on right now. So basically, although we will have NB IoT for most of the applications, also in 5G, we do expect this 5G and our red cap devices to appear soon, and they will complement narrowband IoT devices on the market. So this is something that will happen in next for next years. Also, what, what, uh, there was very big activity on uh, non-terrestrial network support for narrowband IoT, meaning that you can connect your IoT devices not only through standard cellular infrastructure, like standard base station, but also maybe through low Earth orbit satellites. If your devices are somewhere really in deep rural areas where there is no cellular infrastructure, then why not using narrowband IoT over you know, systems like Starlink or OneWeb or one of these uh, low Earth orbit satellite constellations. So this is this is this was very popular topic and it's it's still active part of standardization. In our group, we were very interested in narrowband IoT over drones. So using drones as uh, or UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, as uh, mobile base stations. And I will come back to that a little bit later. So, okay, I'm, I'm now going uh, uh, into our research in, in narrowband IoT. So we started it quite a long time ago, maybe five or six years ago. Uh, we first used some sort of first commercial devices that we could buy. And uh, it was very nice collaboration with the mobile operator here in Serbia. So uh, starting with these devices, we saw that we are not so flexible and generally using commercial off the shelf devices is not the best thing for us. But luckily we have very good electronics group in our, uh, in our department. So these guys were able to produce or design uh, IoT platforms for our own purposes. So first one that they produced is in my hand, you can see it here, it's much more compact. And then uh, based on this platform, uh, many other platforms were developed. Typically, as part of some European Horizon 2020 projects that we participated in. So, at this stage, we have very large narrowband IoT test bed in our building, which means roughly 100 narrowband IoT capable devices for, let's say, some sort of smart building type of applications, more like indoor applications. And uh, within some other project that I might come back later to describe more details. We also designed 50 devices for uh, outdoor mobile use cases, where these devices are then uh, equipped with GPS modules and also accelerometers or IMU sensors. And uh, the principal uh, target was smart logistics applications. So these are some of the platforms that are uh, designed. Uh, you typically rely on uh, narrowband IoT modules that you get from some standard uh, vendors of, of this type of modems. So for example, we mainly used Quectel, but you can use U-Blocks or similar in the market. Inside is a chip by some of the you know, leading chip manufacturers like MediaTek or Qualcomm or, or uh, 
similar high silica or something like that. And then uh, this is your communication module. So basically, whatever you want to send, you send through that, that module. You need to have a microcontroller unit, which will be programmed by specific firmware. And then you would collect data from sensors uh, and uh, you know do some sort of packetization, typically UDP-like or something like that, and send this data over narrow band IoT connection. And uh, one more thing that we, uh, that the guy, electronics guys take a special care of is that they also designed uh, on some of the devices particular uh, circuits so we can measure exactly and very precisely the consumption, power consumption of, of this communication module so that we can see when, you know, this device is spending too much power or battery and when not so that, you know, its operation can be optimized. So, I mean, this is just, uh, uh, again, we, we use very good collaboration with the mobile operator. So there were many base stations ar around our buildings that we used for testing. And then, as I mentioned, we produced a lot of these devices so we can establish a really nice test bed. So one of the things that you would like to do, you, you could, of course, test these devices and collect a lot of data. Nowadays, having a lot of data is very useful because then you can maybe train some machine learning algorithms to be able to, to infer or predict or uh, you know, do something useful for the network operation. So one of the things that uh, we deployed many of these devices from which we could collect uh, very precise MBIoT module power consumption. So how much energy is spent by sending a packet of a given size when you are in specific radio conditions. Of course, it is not the same if the device is in very good radio conditions, then it typically spends a low amount of energy, as opposed to the case when your device is in some basement or some very challenging environment, when for the same amount of data, you spend much, much more energy. Because in aeroband IoT, if you have a very bad radio link, the way to overcome this bad radio link is to repeat the packets many, many, many times. And this is nice because it allows you to use uh, these type of sensors even in one or two floors below the ground in some underground garages or something like that. Or if you have, for example, water meters in some underground places. But the drawback, of course, is that you spend much more energy in sending such packets because you need to over overcome very bad communication channel. OK, we also collected a very detailed data about uh, radio channel quality and also uh, uh, complete logs from the devices about the messages exchanged between the device and the base station so that in the end we can essentially decompose a standard transmission of data packet from the device to the network into very fine-grained measurements of power consumption and uh, you know alignment of this power consumption with some characteristic data uh, exchange between the base station and, uh, and the device. So that we can say, okay, the device is spending that much energy for synchronization, that much energy for uh, system in, uh, information acquisition and so on. And of course, when the device is in worse channel conditions, we could see how much more energy we spend compared to the device which is in good channel conditions. Okay, so then uh, in some of the European projects that we worked on, uh, in one of them, uh, we essentially had a very interesting uh, uh, use case scenario where uh, for one of the partners, it was important that the containers on the trucks, so logistics containers on the trucks, are not only tracked, like if you have a GPS and then you occasionally send the location of the container, but also they wanted to know that the container is not, uh, how can I say, it's not uh, uh, misused in a way that they wouldn't like it to be. So this container shouldn't be uh, overturned or vibrated or, or some sort of stress extensively. Uh, so we implemented a system that essentially measures this information from accelerometers, from onboard accelerometers. And then uh, we deployed large number of the devices on uh, containers on trucks. Actually, this is now ongoing work 
within the project, where uh, these devices collect data and they learn using machine learning algorithms what is the normal vibration of the container while the truck is driving in a normal way uh, and what is anomaly. So when there was an overturnment or some sort of massive shaking of the container. And uh, in case that happens, this algorithm can detect and it can report the situations where this kind of uh, anomaly happens. So this is a this is very popular application nowadays in IoT, anomaly detection. So in this case, it was anomaly relative to, you know, shaking on, 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 of, of some uh, container, but generally anomaly detection algorithms are very useful. They typically indicate you that something is going on unusually and not as it should be. So if you want uh, uh, to deploy such an anomaly detection algorithm, you can also deploy them at the very edge on the device itself, but then you are very much restricted with this uh, microcontroller, which doesn't have a lot of processing power or memory. So another option would be to send data to some edge server or maybe even to set data all the way to the cloud and then use some much more powerful machine learning algorithms. And then, of course, there are good and bad sides for both. Here, you don't send data at all, so it, they stay on the device. You only send some alarm message when there is some anomaly, while uh, to train this and, and, and use these uh, algorithms at the edge or in the cloud, you need constant stream of inputs from the edge devices, which of course takes uh, energy of the battery, takes uh, uplink throughput and so on. So um, it's, it's, it's part of a recent publication related to the joint project. And uh, we also, again, in collaboration with mobile operator, we were able to deploy uh, servers inside the mobile operator network that would uh, be tested as a edge or fog computing nodes where we can you know test the how fast these machine learning algorithms can respond to some situation on the iot node so it was very kind of interesting and useful to to to, to see in commercial narrowband iot network how these things can be done and uh, as I mentioned, 20 of these devices are now cruising around Europe, attached uh, on the containers on the trucks, and they do they collect data for further training of machine learning algorithms and anomaly detection procedures. In another project, we are uh, uh, again interested in IoT communication, but we are interested in collecting not necessarily data from sensors, but uh, some sort of a metadata from sensors, which are called wireless fingerprints. So basically, if you deploy your IoT devices in some, uh, let's say, industrial environment, in some factory or in some hall or in some static location, uh, for example, this device on this picture, any of these 20 devices, they are located at a very specific location and they always send data from that location because they are static, they are not mobile. And after a while, you can actually record the channel quality, the quality of radio channel between the device and the base station. And uh, if you make a sufficiently large log of these channel quality measurements, uh, you will be able to pretty much learn the quality of the channel for that particular device. And it is actually quite different from the neighboring device even though they are very close to each other there are parameters related to radio channel quality which are very different for this device and the neighboring device and based on these radio channel par parameters you can actually distinguish these two devices so this is very important idea so not by looking at anything else but the channel quality you can actually figure out which of the devices is sending data to you. So this is called the device identification using wireless fingerprint. So basically, uh, of course, every device will send its, I don't know, MAC address or IP address, and this is commonly used to identify the device. But maybe some device wants to be malicious and it somehow hijacks 
MAC address or IP address of some other device, this still gives me opportunity to identify that, there, that something is wrong. Because from the radio channel parameters, I can see that this device who pretends to be some other device doesn't have the same radio channel parameters, so there must be something wrong. So, um, you know, this sort of channel quality measurements are nowadays very popular source of information for security applications, basically for prevention of some sort of security threats, but also for many other applications, for example, localization, because once you learn your channels at different locations, then you can take one of these devices and walk around this room. And uh, based on your channel quality parameters, we will be able to recognize where in the room you are. So this is also another application. It is called wire, wireless fingerprinting based localization. So these types of apl applications are, are obviously very popular today. And uh, you, know, you can use narrowband IoT devices. You can also use Wi-Fi devices like the one depicted here to collect this type of wireless fingerprints. So for example, you have Wi-Fi access point here. You have three devices in a small room, very close to each other. But from this channel state information, every of these curves here, which are on this graph, uh, blue ones are recorded from the packets transmitted by blue device. Red ones are transmitted from the packets, are uh, extracted from the packets of, of red device and green one from the green device. And even by you know, visual inspection, you can see that there is quite a significant difference between this channel information. So this can be used as a possible way to recognize which device is transmitting the data. So this is very you know, interesting concept nowadays. OK, I also mentioned that there is a big interest in our group on uh, drone-based communications. Uh, this is also related to smart city applications because obviously drones are very useful for urban areas. Uh, I will also show some rural applications, so not really smart city applications and so on. So uh, maybe two years ago in 2020, a few of my PhD students and uh, some PhD students from another university in Portugal, we decided to go for this uh, competition which is uh, IEEE Vehicular Technology Society Innovation Channel Challenge for small UAV communications. So we proposed a setup like this, where we would have two drones. One is a small drone, uh, which should operate in some mountainous areas. So this is a more rural application, but you can imagine also some urban applications with some very high rise buildings and deep canyons between them. And then uh, this device doesn't have direct connectivity to the base station, so it is in the area which is not covered. And uh, we want this device to collect some very simple information, like some very low, short packets to transmit, but it cannot do it directly because there is no connectivity between the macro base station and the device. And then we would like to deploy this big drone to offer sort of a wireless relay and make a cell below itself to establish connectivity between this drone and the infrastructure. And uh, the application was purely IoT, so not high rates, very low data rates. And uh, the, the target was to you know, design and implement and deploy and demonstrate this type of uh, application. And we wanted to do it again with narrowband IoT technology, but in the end, we did it in a combination with also another uh, IoT technology, which is called LoRa, which is also very popular. And the good thing is that these students, they actually won the first prize. There were two stages of competition. And in both stages, they won the first prize. So it was really a nice experience for them. All of these PhD students were actually uh, awarded, in, in, in not only invested a lot of work, but also in the end, they, they get this recognition. So yes, we, we used two drones. Uh, this one had a, either LoRa or narrowband IoT device on board. And this large drone had, again, narrowband IoT or LoRa devices. In some cases, also some software-defined radio modules. And then there is a macro base station from the mobile operator that we had to use. So we used two scenarios. One is 
backhaul link between the drone and the base station was always narrow band IoT, meaning from this device to the base station. While the link between the two drones was in one experiment, it was LoRa. In another experiment, it was narrow band IoT. For the case when it is narrow band IoT, it's quite challenging actually, because then we need to make a narrow band IoT base station on the drone, which is possible today due to uh, open source software for base 4G base station provided by Open Air Interface and uh, SRSLT. Those are the two main major providers of these kind of solutions. So in the end, it looks like this. Uh, we were able to communicate in the lab using narrowband IoT connection of both links, but not unfortunately in outdoor environment. But in out outdoor environment, we were able to use LoRa link here and narrowband IoT link here. And these are some uh, photos from our demonstration on our building. So the large drone was uh, relayed that was communicating to the remote base station and also to the small drone that was going into this atrium up and down. And basically this small drone was sending some sensor information, for example, GPS coordinates, height, uh, information from uh, accelerometers through this guy all the way to the base station and then to the server where we could watch all the information from sensors in near real time. So this is like very small delay, maybe up to a couple of seconds. And then we also did it in rural area, close to the city of Novi Sad, there is some national park. And indeed, in some of the valleys, there is no signal coverage. So basically, none of the surrounding base station can cover this valley here. And uh, first, we had to lift this big drone to 60, 70 meters to make the connection with one of these base stations, like a backhaul link. And then the small drone was able to move very low above the ground collect some data and transmit it in real time via the big drone. So it was, in a sense, it was successful demonstration and, and it was really, uh, you know, nice proof of concept. And we, of course, are still working on this to collect a lot of measurements and, and do some uh, additional design for, for this use case. So this brings me to an end. Um, for summary, I can just say that uh, Current cellular IoT technologies are very powerful. They offer you huge connection density and connectivity for large number of sensors and large number of applic applications and use cases. It can be in smart city environment. It can also be, you know, in the rural environment that's been demonstrated. And, uh, you know, uh, building and uh, programming these devices is a manageable work. Of course, it needs a lot of experience and uh, and uh, optimization, but in the end, uh, investment into such nodes is not so big, while the benefits can be very large. And uh, most of the mobile operators nowadays around the world, they offer you an opportunity to connect such devices. You typically use standard SIM cards that you plug into these IoT devices, and then you have some sort of a contract with the mobile operator with typically amount of data per year or something like that, that you can upload to, to the servers through their mobile network. And, uh, you know, it opens the door to really a uh, huge number of, of novel applications in smart cities, but also outside of urban areas. And to finish, I would just like to thank uh, two of my colleagues uh, who really contributed a lot to what I present to you today. So thanks a lot. I think I can stop sharing my screen. And that is all from my side. Um, I would like to thank you very much for this amazing uh, presentation. Uh, I think that uh, for broader audience, it's completely clear how critical uh, the telecommunication infrastructure is for smart cities applications. Um, you presented a few amazing examples, uh, which is actually focus of work of you and your uh, research group there. And the most important message for our audience, because I'm pretty sure that not all of them are engineers, but also it's very inspirational to think about uh, 
uh, in which challenges uh, can be applicable with different technology uh, technologies help let's say help because it's very important to understand that design and idea how to resolve problem is not something what is focused on technology it's focused on on people so there is a lot of things behind uh we collecting data we have to think about privacy about cyber security about everything when we have idea how to and which kind of sense we want to apply and which kind of data we want to collect then we can apply different telecommunication technologies mbiot is amazing because it's an environmental friendly energy saving solution uh you also said that uh uh, there is perspective about some kind of upgrade so mbiot will be replaced with uh, uh, newer and better technology in some perspective also after 4g we we, we get uh, 5g we will get in perspective 6g and some other innovations but i think that the picture of triangle of sensing telecommunication infrastructure and big data will be completed today uh, I will not spend your time. I really appreciate uh, um, your your performance and time you, you shared with us here today. I also invite uh, audience to um, send questions because we are going live. So I, I suggest that questions going to comments. Uh, people can tag you or me and leave uh, questions. Maybe there is always some specific interest of somebody for something. Uh, we, will, we are not able to discuss everything for a few hours, but it's really important that we inspire people to think about uh, smart cities and uh, new urban living uh, style, let's say, for 21st century, supported by amazing and novel technologies and solutions. So, Professor Kovratovic, thank you very much, and I wish you a lot of success in your uh, future work, as well as your group at University of Novi Sad. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll just ask if you can uh, give me back the host uh, uh, before. Uh, yes, if I know how to do it. Uh, I think it's uh, there. Uh, there is a participant list, and then uh, uh, when you move uh, okay. Pointer okay. to my name, you have more, and you can just. Uh, okay, make hosts. Okay, perfect. Yes. Yes, that's it. So Hi. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Alexander Lins Georgievich. He's a co-founder of Data Science Conference. Uh, it's uh, one of the largest data science conferences uh, uh, in the world. It's a uh, few series. Uh, Alex, you're already with us. Uh, Thank you very much for your time. Uh, data science is something what becomes uh, critically important for the context of smart. And I, I said a few words in introduction, uh, in my introduction talk uh, that actually, when we have data, when we collect data, when we process data, we can find additional knowledge and our machines, our system can uh, self-manage can be self-managed as uh, self-regulated, self-optimized based on collected data as some kind of day, their uh, experience. So without data science, uh, it's for sure there is no smart, but I will not share the answer. Uh, I will just uh, leave uh, the Alex uh, opportunity. I, will, I just said that uh, uh, Mr. Georgievic is co-founder of, of, of data science conference. It's, uh, huge data scientist community uh, standing behind around the world. There are a few additions of, of this conference, uh, United States, Europe, etc. But I will just leave that uh, Mr. Georgievic share with us uh, uh, more details. I would like to, to share you uh, with you. Uh, I'll just create your host so you can share your, your, your screen. And uh, you have a lot of lights behind, maybe, maybe, uh, if you just move a little bit, uh, because yeah, it's it's about contrast. Uh, we cannot see you at least for the beginning for introduction. Just uh, that we no, can no, introduce it's not you a problem. I will just okay. Yes. It's 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 much better so audience can meet our Alex. Alex, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and uh, thank you, Alexander, as well. Uh, my uh, we have this, we share the same name. 
Uh, thank you for invitation to become speaker at this uh, conference, demystifying, demystifying uh, smart in cities. Uh, as you mentioned before, uh, my uh, talk is going to be focused on data science as the key foundation of smart. Because uh, when you talk about uh, the, uh, smart cities, we are talking about a lot of lot of input data, a lot of sensors, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, lot of uh, connected devices and everything and everything we are doing in that field it's uh, oriented toward generating some data uh if you want to be smart truly smart we need to know how to manage that how what is the what is the usage what kind of data we are using why we are using where we are using so basically uh as as you mentioned my my focus will be on data science uh one slide about me just two okay sorry just to, to explain a little bit more, uh, like uh, like you mentioned, I'm uh, the founder of uh, Data Science Conference franchise. Uh, we started in Belgrade back in 2015. Uh, it was a small local conference for about 250, 350 people. Right now, last year, we had over six and a half thousand people from 150 countries attending our biggest event, Data Science Conference Europe. Right now, we have an active conference in Data Science Croatia. 22, which will happen live in May, uh, and one of the two headliners we're going to have are Martin Mosler, who is Managing Director of Science Park Grad. He's also a EEEE member, and he's Ambassador of European Space Agency. He's a very cool guy. Uh, and uh, the second uh, key, uh, lineup is going to be Leanne Fitzpatrick, and she's Director of Data Science at Financial Times. So basically, you can see it's going to be very, very interesting. But like I said, this is not uh, the concept. Uh, what is my background? Bes be beside being the alma uh, spiritus movens of data science, uh, uh, data science community back in the, let's say, southeastern and uh, central Europe, also the whole Europe, to be honest, and not to be uh, modest. Uh, I'm also data scientist by vocation. So basically, that's how I started to do the conferences because I couldn't uh, learn that much in Europe back in 2015 when a few of my friends and myself included started this this uh, conference without further ado i would just like to uh, to share with you the key point i'm going to sh uh, talk about today and that is uh, in the first place uh, we are going to, to talk about uh, various data and smart cities i think it's a very important uh, uh, important thing about uh, when we are talking about data science is to understand where we can find uh, the data, data uh, how the data is generated why is data generated and after that we can talk about usage of that the second thing is uh, data science use cases in smart cities where, where we're i'm going to share with you where we can uh, how the data science is implemented basically and maybe some of things most probably you already know about that but uh, the thing is uh, but the thing is that uh, it's not only about knowing but also understanding why we are using data and basically that will be the key point to to show with you where uh, how data science is basically implemented in the in the in the data in the smart cities uh, and the last but not the least i think it's very important to talk about some kind of obstacles and let's say uh, pain and pressure points of uh, data science but not only data science but also smart cities as well and that is uh, data governance on the first place and the ethical ai is the second second thing uh, we need to, we, we need to tackle uh, why do I think it's important to talk about something not uh, non-technical in a technical community? Because we are the one who are implementing these things. They are not going to be some, let's say, freedom fighters in, or some like human rights watchers to understand technology better than people who are technical person. We are the one who are setting the tone. We are the one who need to be the first one to 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 give our hands, open hands to the people who are who are much bigger experts than we are. Uh, in these fields. If you don't do that, we will end up in some kind of regulation such as GDPR, which is very cool, but it's not implementable. Even right now, uh, let's say this is, a, this is a little bit of, uh, let's say, uh, some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, first, first, uh, first news served that even the, the founders of GDPR, uh, as a concept, they are thinking about uh, uh, creating the rule that is uh, that is uh, it is okay not to permanently delete the data when when user asks because that's going to affect the model a lot and it's going to cost a lot and basically in some bigger cities it's, it's virtually impossible to delete delete your data for 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 good why why i'm saying this thing i'm going to rephrase that in the third part of my talk 
part time going to, I'm talking about this because uh, we are the one the technical experts that need to address these things and to talk about it and to be involved as equal partners with, like I said, philosophers, uh, uh, social scientists, as well as lawyers and uh, human rights advocates, uh, you know, building, uh, building a trustworthy network of AI. Uh, let's start with something that I think that uh, we need to, uh, to as, as, as a beginning, and uh, in front I need to apologize because this is going to be a little bit longer talk, uh, I will going to use from time to time, but I hope that Alexander will not, uh, uh, that is okay with you, but uh, in the first place, uh, I would like to say that when we are talking about where is the data in where is the science, let's say, uh, in the terms of for the uh, smart cities, on the first place we are talking about big data analytics. Uh, what is big data analytics? That is analytics on a big volume of data. And uh, when somebody asked me on my on my previous company that I was working as a data scientist, what is big data? And I, ha I have heard an excellent answer. That is the data that cannot be open with Excel. <laughs> so basically that's that's when we are talking about the volume and about it, that means that everything above 1 billion of rows, let's say in 2010, perhaps, it's called big data. When you're talking about big data right now, if you have more than 10, 10, 10, uh, 10 billions of rows, that means that you are using big data, basically. Uh, when we are talking about uh, who can generate these kind of things, smart cities are the, the first and foremost, uh, foremost with something that is coming to our mind. Also, everything related to the, to the image uh, and uh, image recognition and something like that, that's also big data because we are talking about volumes in, uh, right now in a zettabytes of data. For example, I know the case where, where the people who develop, some, let's say, one solution in image recognition, they need on a daily level more than 150 zettabytes of data if you're talking about one year of data you cannot imagine how much is that so basically we are as the human uh, human uh, human race and basically because of the smart cities in the first place we are generating a lot of lot a lot of data uh being said that uh the most important things to understand is that we can do some kind of analytics it's not doesn't need to be ai ml data science per se on the first place and it shouldn't be on the first place on the first uh on the on the first place we first need to start with analytics uh when we are talking about analytics we can get uh various various uh various various things for example from the from the texting uh, we are using on social and social networks we can do sentiment analysis so we can use that sentiment analysis to see if some part of is there some big, big problem in our cities some something need to be uh let's say expressed uh, uh, react very expressively like uh in, in terms of like i don't know few days or a few hours even we need to, to know how we are doing so how we are doing that by central analysis of social networks uh for example uh, we can also do we can also do from a biological standpoint so there is some some big uh let's say for, uh, from air pressure or something like that that's not big data but it's also analytics uh if we see that the 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 the, the amount of co2 in the in the in the air is too high we should have some kind of system alarming the like the, the parents that they shouldn't or should try to keep their children in the home because especially when we are talking about this thing when children are developing there is a lot of it if they are not having a, a health environment they can have a lot of health issues uh, in in later years of their development like i don't know when they're uh, young adults or even adults so basically if we have a good monitoring system because it's right now unfortunately it's impossible to have a clean air in in a big city is that something that also ai and ml which users of sensors can be one of the things that we can work on and solve that and it's not only about the green energy we can talk we'll talk about a bit later I'm the fan of nuclear energy, not green energy. Then I will say that on the first place because for me, nuclear energy is a green energy. But uh, if we are doing this, we, we can also use to, to lower the, the pressure on the health systems, not right now, but in 10 or 15 years from now. One saying this because the key point of analytics, people do forget one thing. They're only talking about, okay, what we can do in terms of six months, 12 months, 18 months. That's not true. That's totally like, uh, not using the full power of analytics and after that if we're not using the full power of analytics we're not using after that the full power of machine learning ai and, uh, and very very close amount of time quantum computing as well that's also something that is going to be 
uh, or problem solver in terms of uh, in terms of smart cities. But we are not thinking about of uh, how many, how much uh, perspective risk uh, and how much perspective cost in like five or ten or fifteen years from now we can save. But by uh, very simple analytics, and with that simple analytics, we can use that educate the people we can talk with uh, communicate with our citizens that's also very important we need to think about analytics as a tool especially in the, in the terms of smart cities with a lot of sense we can generate data uh, when we are talking about i'm sorry for this how we generate the data basically uh, it's uh, in the first place we need to think about how do we collect data we can collect data from city machine equipments. When we are talking about that, can be I don't know, paying a ticket, uh, uh, paying uh, like uh, taking some information from our smart sensors. Uh, I don't know, all, also from the from the gas station, we can get the data how many you know, how many people are passing by and driving through. We can have city sensors, for example. When we are talking about city sensors, what is an example of the data generated? Uh, we we can we can get uh, like traffic jams much easier to connect not only. Not only with the uh, with the uh, well, let's to be honest. Like right now, Google has a really really good model with a lot of data to generate approximately not approximate but basically uh, in terms of like one minute or sixty seconds. You can imagine that you can you can you can be sure uh, on the trip like five hundred kilometers when you're going to arrive. That's that's ludicrous, uh, ludicrous. But also, we can use uh, sensors to to measure. I don't know the, the air pressure. Uh, we can me measure the pollution. We can me measure also in uh, health systems what is happening. Also, what is important is public data markets. So we can get uh, information regarding uh, what we are buying, how we are buying, how we are eating. Also, as well, if we are eating uh, uh, enough health food or not, uh, is a promotion of health food uh, good or not good? Because this is the thing that we can we can do for the citizens to live better. We can also see how we can lower some kind of cost. We can also see if there is a potential for the, I don't know, for the monopoly between uh, the different different stakeholders, like big, big, big companies, they can uh, monopoly together. And we can see that that trends to public data markets. Also, asset service uh, uh, state station is something that we can we can use to see how we are using some of the service that are available in our live cities, how we are, is, is it, uh, we can get not only data of if somebody is using, when we are talking about this kind of data, uh, we are also going to talk about analyzing. It's not only data one or zero, every data has a lot of, it's not binary data, it's more of a, about quantum, a quantum state of the data. When you're getting one or zero, in that one or zero, you have a lot of, lot of, lot of different decisions behind it. So basically one row of data, one column of data uh, contains much more what we can learn about it. We can learn, for example, uh, if uh, the service is uh, visible enough, do people know about it? In which kind of part of the cities do the people know how to use some kind of service? So basically, like I said, it's not only about thinking uh, as a one of zeros. It's about thinking about uh, what is all of information is uh, behind that decision in the end to so be one or zero. Uh, data management as well. It is very important, and we'll talk uh, uh, much more in the last part about data management. Uh, data management is how we basically manage our data. Uh, it's not only about collecting the data, but also how to analyze it in real time. Sometimes it's much better to have a, a less uh, less precise model that will give us some information in real time than to have like one day of model running. In my terms of, let's say, for example, this is the most 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 famous case is that risk model in bank. They need around one or two days to run, three days even, to run to create some kind of model. But basically, uh, if you have an opportunity on the spot of the second to give the person who is like talking with the with, with, uh, with person in live to see some kind of credit score and also some kind of thing, they, uh, she or he can verify these kind of things in, in real time because he can talk with the person. So basically, with the good data management, what we are what we are doing as well. One of the things, of course, there's a lot of good things, but one of the things we can still uh, have control over the system so we can be human in the loop, making the decision. So basically, and that's very important from the from the philosophical side of the question, are we in the control or are we making our decision or somebody else is making? One thing is helping in decision making and improving the process of uh, digesting the data behind it of all of information that we are gathering from this data and knowledge in the end that we are acquiring. 
But in the end, if we don't learn something from that, in philosophical sense and society development sense, we are not doing the right thing. Because if you want to be uh, to understand why we are doing something, that that that's that's the key point of analytics. It's not about it's not about analytics just to say okay we are saving 10 15 20 that's in the end result but also to learn from the process to improve the process that's how we come to this part of love let's say so that's that, that that's the key point from, from my point of view of our society development also it is uh, it is about data enrichment what kind of data we can and i talk about a little bit but also we can also see how we can connect different, uh, how we can uh, how we can uh, collect something uh, something additionally because we are analyzing the data and we are seeing, okay, let's see, uh, let's see, uh, let's see if we okay we are monitoring CO two, but maybe we can also monitor some some different aspects, different columns in in the end we can get a much more, more better models and maybe not only better models but models that can fit much much closer. There's something that is a uh, that is a uh, there is a lot of uh, different algorithms how they are built of course everybody heard about the genetic algorithm but they are only one part of the algorithm that simulate the, the nature how nature is behaving so what we know as a data scientist as well that there is a lot of uh, a lot of lot of uh, uh, algorithms they are running much more faster natural algorithms than human made algorithms because they already have more than 1 million of years or even more of developing itself and, and uh, point 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 out to be true or a false. So basically, there's a lot of different approaches, like in, in terms of that. In the end, also what we need to see is integration, and this is something that is very 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 complex thing. Uh, and maybe I'm not not trying to let's say discourage you, but I just want to, to present you the real case where we are right now and where we will be like even 10 or 15 years from now integration of different data on the same level is mathematically very 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 big and interesting problem to solve let's call the let's not say challenge let's say problem because it is a problem like you have like i don't know uh, 1000 different data sets and we are talking 1000 data sets on one billion of rows so it's like volume of these two sounds like okay what is the problem with one 1000 uh, data to like connect it is very problem if you like uh, measuring one data on one minute, the second one on one hour, and the third one on 15 seconds. Integration of these kind of things and duplicating or not duplicating, connecting up to that, building data lake or data lake house, which is the newest concept like presented like one month ago, uh, Databricks started to talking about, I know my friend talked about it like three years ago or five years ago, but the thing is, building data like house and up to that uh, uh, tons of warehousing systems that you can use to analyze data very, very fast and to manage data, to store data and to build the whole process there. That's something that is that is very interesting. And last but not the least, uh, like I said, we need to collect data after that analyze and to make decisions. Decision intelligence is the key. Like people forget about, and that's why I'm saying human in the loop decision is very important because it's helping us to make some kind of decisions like i don't know to uh, to send like information if we are having like and then we talk about a little bit more if our like uh, health data are not good if we can connect that with our uh, health appointment that, that just connect you call you okay and say okay you need to come to our office to see you have some big irregularities in your health data that can prevent a lot of not only like human in the terms and that's of course the most important thing human like uh, bad uh, like negative stories such i don't know unfortunately it's not only about some some somebody pass away but also somebody can be like turned into, into like uh, disabled people or something like that if you can prevent this like from the side of the human side that's that's unbelievable success but also it's not about unbelievable success like the from economical point of view one dollar put into a prescription is like ten dollars into intervention it, it, it is kind of like we can save 10 times more uh, amount of money if we can connect smart cities and smart healthcare into one app i just wanted to say that also you can see this um, and i didn't want to go <laughs> too much into this legacy system, uh, city systems but believe me this is something that is going to be a pressure point for a lot what does it legacy city systems mean uh, this is something that we have built over like last 30 and 40 years a lot of that systems to just uh, jump to the new one, it is impossible in terms, it, it's even not, it's not even like paying, paying it's like a ludicrous amount of money, but it's impossible 
because some of the systems are very connected and it's very hard to, to do so. That's why when we are talking about legacy system, we need to also think about how to integrate. And I think that, and I truly do believe that this kind of be, can be a very interesting AI case like uh, that should be, I'm not working on that, but somebody of you may be triggered by with this talk and think about it to create AI that is turning legacy systems into one integrated system. If we can create something like this, this is like, uh, this is the $1 billion idea, not $1 billion, $100 billion idea. But if you can do this AI to, to translate uh, legacy systems into one integrated system, this is something that will solve all of our problems from the technical, most of our problems from the technical side of you. Uh, regarding the, uh, also, uh, uh, what I wanted to talk about, uh, okay, we know where the data is, but how we can use data. Basically, as you can see, the most important things are, uh, let's say, uh, divided into seven sectors. The first one is a smart, uh, let's say, traffic jam, smart road, communication, GPS, etc. The second one is the uh, machine intelligence. Uh, we need to, to not forget that when we are talking about smart cities, uh, it's not only about having a city. All of the cities, most of the cities worldwide, they're having a lot of a uh, lot of manufacturing there, much uh, like uh, power some kind of, uh, I don't know, some companies like Bosch or something like that, they're having in, in, in the city area, they're having their uh, their their uh, factories because of the volume of the people. So machine intelligence in uh, something that can it, it's very important and it's part of smart cities, data science and smart cities. Also, we talk about energy. Energy is vital for the, for the, uh, for the uh, data science as well. How we can use for example, we can optimize the the the, the, the uh, network grids. I know, for example, uh, for sure that there, there was example in Finland, like a few years ago, uh, they managed to create the most important mines in energy sector to optimize some of like three of the, their most biggest uh, most biggest uh, power plants, and they uh, used also students to build AI network to optimize, and the students created 10% better results than the greatest mines. So, it, and you can imagine what can be a, a what can be a combination of these two together. I think it's not only about it's having like ten percent more, but also in times that is needed to be uh, something that's needed to be done. I know about the famous case uh, regarding the uh, regarding the, uh, the 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 mad behind it. There was like uh, an analyzing social network comments. Uh, the professor from Crete, uh, I think that he was from Crete, from Israel, basically Israel. Sorry for that. Uh, from uh, from a small uh, university of Haifa, uh, they were doing a lot. It was one big project, like international big project, regarding the uh, the the classifiers on on the on the social social network. On the first place, they created the most the, the biggest, like the most uh, like uh, the greatest uh, breakthrough was one day when they first uh, introduced AI and ML model. Uh, basically what the guy did, uh, he said, okay, this is not good for me. I would like to go into math, in, deep into math. And he basically, you know, like two months after that, he created, uh, he go into deep of mathematical models. He understand that is, uh, it's not about the process because uh, it's uh, like, what is the first point and end point? Uh, basically equipotential lines are, are the key was there. So basically we are talking about a lot of engineering stuff at math. And he understand that he only need to first and the last thought. He doesn't need to have all the dots in, in between, the states in between. So he managed to create like that the model is running one uh, in one hour basically. And, and that was like even greater breakthrough. And he was also not satisfied with that. So he goes into that and build a model that is not only going the first and the last, but he's also making the, he's, he's looking for the optimal, uh, optimal, uh, optimal uh, coordinate system. It's fair or something like that to create even better model. And he managed to create something that's on the first day, one day uh, running the model to 60 seconds. What I'm saying like this to understand, it's not about IT people, just IT people, of course, building it's not IT people because data scientists and engineers are not IT per se. They are one side of the IT. That's important. But it's not about us building the model. It's about us together with math people, engineers building all of this together. It's not us or versus them or you versus us. It's us together. And we can create a lot of good cool stuff like this. And we can exponentially build whatever we are building right now. So basically what we're thinking that we can create in 10 years, if you just learn how to, to work together without an ego, we can maybe create in two years what we think is 10 years.
potential for that is unbelievable. We need to understand that. Also, what we can use, it's like like we can see, it's a it's a it, it's a facial recognition camera usage. Uh, of course, I will talk a bit more about ethical because I'm very concerned about ethical part of the uh, usage of camera and facial recognition. But this also can can be helpful, especially when talking about like I don't know. Unfortunately, there's a, right now we don't have that, but uh, there is a possibility in the future to have some kind of terrorist attack. Uh, facial recognition camera are right now it's students can build a model that can recognize you if you have a problem like that basically so that, that's something that can be a very very cool and something that can can uh, it's not a, and we are talking about terrorist attacks not only about uh, the loss of the lives which is very unfortunate but also is about the fear that is happening to create that is the biggest also problem because it's not paralyzing only the the, the, the lives of the families that lost some uh, some of the loved ones but also the whole society that is paralyzed by fear we need to address these kind of problems also of course we are talking about financial uh, aspects uh, our payment systems i don't know smart payments uh, nft payment nft bitcoins like a pay payless uh, 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 paperless payment that's something that can be used smart cities data science uh, uh, and last two but not the least are the uh, how we can use smart houses basically of course you all know that we can lower our, our uh, on two Two things we can do with data science. First one is to lower, lower our uh, like uh, the cost of living in the house and cities, which is important because we can use it, that that amount of money for something else. If if nothing else, we can use it for much healthier life. That's very important. Life lifespan, not only uh, lifespan but also health span is very important. Health span is how much of our life we are uh, we are living our health life in optimum. And also, we can also save the energy, uh, like energy savings, etc., which is also very important for the, for the, for our uh, sustainable goals development, and something we can leave for our future until we create, I don't know, some kind of battery that can solve our problems, or we all change to the nuclear energy. Uh, and like I said, the last thing is very important is about the health sector. Health is something that is. Uh, that is uh, that is very very important. Like I said, and we can use like smart sensors. We can also use, let's say, there is there is a famous a famous uh, example that when you are uh, when you you are like uh, walking on, on the uh, walking on some 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 blocks that you are generating power. And I just just read uh, recently, and I'm not sure which country it is, but uh, I know that for the fact they are uh, uh, they implement this on the uh, on the uh, on the football field. And uh, the people who are playing football are basically generating enough energy to be uh, to uh, to lights to be uh, to doing at their fullest power without any kind of uh, supporting light. So basically, the the, uh, the 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 players who are playing the football they are creating this, and basically this is zero zero uh, zero zero uh, gas uh, uh, submission. Of course, we need to create all of these things, etc. Okay. But we all the time need to create some, some kind of energy for this one. But can you imagine that all of the stadiums on the world, if you implement this kind of technology, and I think it's Samsung, I'm not sure 100%, I think that Samsung is building this, but that we can create enough that we don't have any kind of, every stadium on, on worldwide is going to be basically uh, zero gas energy. That, that, that's awesome. And like I said, uh, when we're talking about that, some of the most, let's say, most, most famous things are, uh, what we are doing in the uh, in the field of the smart and the data science is the smart buildings, of course, uh, uh, cloud gateways, uh, smart parking, smart safety, uh, smart trash as well, and uh, smart lighting. Uh, this is also important regarding smart lighting because this is all, but there is some unbelievable consumption of the of the uh, of the uh, some of the uh, of the. Uh, of the of the uh, energy uh, when you're talking about uh, turning big data into insights like when we are talking about okay this is awesome but we need to spend some kind of money inside of that it's not only to being being good but also there is a reduction uh, basically we can save uh, in city planning operation uh, basically a lot of money if you can see uh, we can we can save uh, more than 58 millions in, in infrastructure uh, if we are using data science big data sensors in smart cities so basically just to be coordinated the 58 trillions basically in terms of on in terms of uh, five years we can use in terms of water management uh, we can also use 60 uh, percent of the water can be saved that's 40 billion 
worldwide. Uh, in regarding open clouds, we can uh, say more than 37,000 servers, which is equivalent uh, of 6 billion. In substation analytics, we can, we can on a yearly level uh, save up to per person 50 hours of traffic. That means that in, with, with using smart cities, data science AI, we can save 50 hours of our lives that will never come back in the city jams. And that's equivalent to 30 billion by McKinsey. Uh, to be like 100% honest, I know about these numbers. I didn't go into details like, okay, how did it come to, to 50, 30 billion? I have some skeptics about calculation, etc. But of course, this is something that can be relevant. Also, when we are talking about smart cities, uh, uh, use cases, it's important to talk about 10, 10, uh, the top 10 use cases. The first one is like, uh, uh, and that's with 74% of smart cities using is connected, uh, connected public transport. Uh, how data science is used behind it, basically there is a lot of interconnected, uh, interconnected data transmitted from the buses and, and uh, they are like uh, used in the planning part. Uh, what does it mean? That means that uh, we have like, I don't know, two, three, five, ten years of data, how people are using uh, transportation. We can see where transportation, uh, trans transportation, uh, transportation uh, pinpoints are when there is too many people on the on the on the on the on the on the waiting line for the buses. So basically, we can use data science to to predict. Okay, how we can connect and when when should uh, some of the some of the uh, lines uh, bus line starts. Also, what is the second thing is traffic monitoring and management, which 72% of the smart city use cases are there. Uh, what, what, how we can use that, uh, their data science? On the first place, we can use in the terms of uh, optimizing the network. This is unbelievably, unbelievably hard issue if we are doing manually. I don't know if somebody, if somebody of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, road uh, road engineers are here or listening to us and traffic engineers but this is something that is very very hard optimization problem i i had spoken with uh, people from china like a few years ago i was monitoring one of the panels and i was asking them how they are doing because they were they were saying that they are doing all of aml to be honest it's around they are not using as well there is too much romantize about china using the, the, the technology they are using the technology but not on the same level we are thinking there is a little bit more story behind it that realistically they are all the time using not that's not the true in all the case but i know for the fact in some cases that is like okay that's 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 not really realistic it's not real but the thing is if you're using for example ml uh, systems we can we can we can save a lot of to, to see how we can create a green light especially when we're talking about the night ride etc uh, also, water level flood monitoring is regarding environment. It's very important for the cities such as Amsterdam or some 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 cities. They are they are uh, they are uh, they are near uh, the uh, near the uh, near the, the sea level. Where the sea level is high. That we can we can see and uh, optimize uh, the level of the uh, the level of the uh, the level of the. Uh, uh, flood. If there is a flood, there is a lot, of, a lot of problem, of course, because uh, a lot of human lives can be sacrificed, uh, can be can be lost, and there is a lot of damage that can be uh, that get, that can be that can be uh, uh, that can be influenced. It's only about that. When we are talking about those smart cities, we also do forget that there is a, a lot of agriculture also there. If the the agricultural land is flooded with the flooded with the uh, flooded with the uh, uh, flooded with the water. It is going to be contaminated for uh, some unbelievable amount of years. We can use data science to predict uh, when we should rise or when we should uh, make some kind of, uh, let's say, uh, green or green, orange, or red light so people can address this and send them with, uh, with some kind of. And we are talking about, if you can see right now, we're not on talking about data science per se, but also data science with software engineering, some kind of solutions. So we, build like uh, monitoring system and, uh, and informational system so we can inform the people who are like in these kind of areas uh, not only on one place but on two or three or four play, uh, different devices so they can learn which is very important for them to to be prepared and to prepare something like that so basically we can save a lot a lot of things video surveillance analytics uh, this is like 72 percent by by uh and i did to talk to, to took this i think i i, I suppose that, that there is much more but people not not talking about that it's not only about china london is also using video surveillance paris is using video surveillance so basically uh how what is it how we can use for a good let's say 
uh, video surveillance analytics, basically we can we can predict traffic jams. That's the, that's 50 hours we are talking about that can be saved. Uh, it's, it's very complex things to analyze the, the pictures and after that creating a model. It's not it's uh, the, the problem should be, it's much more uh, data storage is needed to 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 store the to store the store the image than it's needed to store uh, one row of data. Uh, connected street lights, as we also said, uh, we can we can we can save a lot a lot of uh, energy if we, we have connected street lights to, to be monitored and uh, uh, put in motion. Uh, regarding sixth, what better monitoring? This is something that is uh, that is uh, that is uh, that is come to the come to the conclusion that can be a good thing, and it's and basically most of the data that was used was also used by the airplanes or collecting the data so basically if you ask yourself why the weather control and weather models are not that good anymore that's because of the COVID, a sub effect of the COVID, not because the pilots had COVID, but because the airplanes were not managing to get the data to the to, to building the models before this uh, the basically it was very hard to predict because much of the things were manually uh, and but we are using airplanes to uh, better monitoring this is this is something that can be used for the people to inform them so they can see how they can uh, prepare themselves should they bring their umbrella or something and maybe this sounds trivial uh, before this but like i said it's something that can be uh, for uh, it can be a good cool thing for the for the, the, the citizens to use as we all know also the seventh one is air quality and pollution monitoring uh, basically, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, what is the, the pollution of uh, of of, CO2, of air, what is CO two like in in the uh, in the in the air, and like I said, I will not repeat myself because I talk a little bit more in previous slide. Uh, smart metering water. Uh, also, what we can do, we can, our houses. We're talking about uh, smart houses, but not only smart houses, but some bigger bigger stadiums as well, bigger uh, smart buildings. Uh, let's say not only smart house, but smart buildings we are talking about in some uh, bigger sense. Uh, with, uh, we, we, can, uh, we can use this to monitor, uh, uh, to save water. So we are talking about 60% of uh, like clean water of usage, uh, uh, water for usage can be saved. Uh, how we are using data science behind it, uh, basically we can, we can adopt uh, like uh, by the person, we're talking about smart houses, it's much easier than smart buildings. But in smart houses, basically, we can we can we can use sensors, and uh, the sensors can uh, can learn over data uh, over time how many for the different aspects of our smart of our uh, water consumption are used for the for the uh, for the person. So basically, it can it can learn from many for more than one uh, one person in the in the second. Sorry, I need to take a sip of coffee uh, about uh, the. Uh, about how we are using our, I don't know, there's uh, four family members in one house, uh, all of them can have their specifics. So basically that's, that's awesome. Like also, okay, the, the, um, uh, the level of uh, charge for the water is also going to be influenced, but that's not that, that, that expensive, but also that there's also that kind of uh, thing. Something that is also can be a cool thing is fire and smoke detection that sometimes uh, we can also use a uh, connection between different different stakeholders so basically when we there is a smoke to to already alert uh, alert the the uh, the, uh, the the fire fire trucks and also with connection with connect the public transport uh, connected street uh, traffic monitoring and management if you connect three different one we can make the optimum route, route for every fire truck to be in uh, lowest amount of time on the desired place can you imagine that that the example there is a traffic jam somewhere that that uh, all of the sensors the cars can get the information uh and we are talking about distributed systems and data data like uh, also data science behind it distributed systems that send the information to the to all, all of the all of the cars not to go there and to just uh, realize that there is a so far just can go there uh, and last but not the least is also something connected with air quality, uh, like quality of life. That's water quality monitoring. In uh, unfortunately, in, uh, in in the last ten years, we have a lot of pollution in our waters, and that's something that can be used. Uh, being said that, uh, I would just like to go into a few concrete de details uh, how uh, how uh, how um, data science and AI is connected. On the first place, there is some green deal examples. Uh, and that's how we can improve the urban environment and mitigate climate change by harnessing the power of data. Uh, basically, what we are doing in the first place, on, in this case, uh, what I found, and that's Erasmus uh, is, was doing this kind of project. This, this project, uh, they were doing analysis heat demand. Basically, they were seeing how many heat is generated by 
different parts of the cities. They have calculated the energy potential with uh, 3D to improve energy level of for all office buildings. And this is important because not all of, if you can see there is a red, green, uh, and uh, there is a red uh, and uh, an orange, orange offices. Not all of the offices are, uh, not all of the offices are the same. Not all of the people are, are having the, the same opportunity to go, not to go to their jobs. And basically be, 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 uh, being said that we can basically create uh, what is the heat demand and be, uh, to plan, to, 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 uh, to, to have a smart plan how we can uh, how we can uh, predict confrontation level in cities on street level, implant traffic measures or inform citizens on safe and polluted place. Uh, what is the, the biggest, uh, what is our, just, let's say, uh, the conclusions that we get from these kind of things, we can see if we would like to, uh, to live in this kind of environment or not. For example, if I can see on the, the lower part of the screen, there is a, some green light. For example, me as a person, if I'd like to start a family, I would think about perhaps living in that place instead of this that is, uh, that is mostly red. Because like I said, there's a lot of things uh, influencing our life, and especially when we are talking about the younger, the young, uh, y uh, our youngest uh, part uh, of our race, our children, et cetera, babies as well, uh, that we are like, uh, need to pro provide them, uh, provide them um, optimal source uh, uh, for uh, their development. Being said that, like I said, this is something just to see, it's not only, it's not, let's say just, okay, you're putting model and that's the end. This is like the project that was, was doing like 18 months behind it. And it, it is, it had a lot of success. Uh, right now to be like 100% sure, I'm, I'm not sure in which cities this is implemented, but I think some kind of this Erasmus project, but some kind of variation this project, I know this implemented in more than 65, I think that that's the last data, 65 uh, smart cities, but not only smart cities, that's also important to say, for example, Belgium is not smart city, but we have this kind of thing also implemented and, uh, you know, on some of our websites for, uh, for the, for the, uh, when people would like to rent some place, which is great. That means that not only about smart cities, all of this technology can be implemented also trained on smart cities but not only used for the smart cities. And being said that uh, the, the important smart cities, it's, it's going to be, in, um, especially in the minds of the technical people, is going to be even more valuable as an asset because not all of the things need to be smart to be understand to use system because in, in some point of time, we're going to use how to use the data from smart city on non-smart cities to provide all of these people the equal important life because it's possibly, and unfortunately, that's true. It's not possible for every city to be as smart. Also, when we're talking about healthcare, uh, healthcare is uh, it's very important part. And there is a famous case when, uh, and this is something that is much more implemented in the U.S. To be honest, in European or in, or Asian uh, continent or Australia, I'm not sure, but I think it's the same level. Uh, basically, there is a, something that's called. Uh, smart meters for example uh this is the uh, this is a cool case where basically your data is being monitored by smart uh, by one watch and it's going to be is projected on your mirror on the, in the beginning of the day it's something that is not like sending you notification every one minute or something like that because that's not something that people are used to anymore because everybody is sending notification that's 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 an issue but also it is like uh it is a uh, more oriented toward the toward the uh, connection with your doctor and to show you if there is some problem and also inform you, you should contact your doctor or just to click, should I inform your doctor that you would like to go there? This is something that, that this is per se example of smart city, smart health, uh, smart health, uh, healthcare system using data science and data behind it because all of the data process behind ai systems that is analyzing if something is according to your data is not because there is some let's say a uh, medium of values a range of values that are totally fine for like every human being but every one of us is the being and species for uh, being for itself our homeostasis is different uh, per person and being said that we need to be uh, uh we need to be personalization we're talking about personalization that's one-on-one -on -one ai and that's something that, that, that that's important thing to say. Also, uh, the things that were, were uh, the famous case, and then this is this is a case I, I used to let's say to promote a little bit of Belgrade, the city I live in. Uh, we have a uh, we have a, 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 a lots of more than thousands of thousands of camera who are very produced, uh, and we are we are what we are doing with that camera. <laughs> we are being told that we are only used for that. 
we are using for uh, monitoring traffic jam and and uh, helping making decisions regarding the traffic and and uh, and and etc problems in belgium we don't have a metro unfortunately so basically this is a huge 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 problem and it's something how the quality of citizen life can be improved also uh, uh, what i wanted to to stress about is the top or a smart city solution regarding the and how they are using data as well, data science be, uh, behind it. So the for, for let's say top smart city solution for uh, smart cities are uh, first one is Moment Wireless Power, and basically that's in Washington, uh, and that is uh, automated wireless charging uh, uh, as an alternative to plug in. Uh, charging in uh, caters to, to for the batteries so valid electric vesicles. Uh, basically, uh, how wh what is the what is the data behind it? Uh, data behind it is that they are doing this without supervision uh, and under different weather condition uh, as the, the device transmits electric energy through air, water, and ice. So basically, how data science is used? Basically, this is very close to physics part. They are using various models, uh, analyzing data, and predicting where they should uh, help them to have a wireless power. The second one is the include, uh, which is uh, which is uh, located in Italy, and basically, uh, they are uh, they are. Uh, in Italy, sorry, in Croatia, uh, basically a smart suite of furniture, uh, and that is uh, a Croatian startup include. Uh, what they are doing, they are producing smart better and what wandle resistant branches, branches covered with solar panels. Uh, basically, uh, how data science can be used here is basically to create, we can see what is the need, what is the consumption, and uh, uh, where we, how we can improve the qu uh, quality of life. Uh, in terms of if there is a more, let's say, uh, more uh, more approaches uh, toward like I, I don't know vandalism they can send us a bit uh, uh, more information uh, the third one is uh, uh, ASO recycling uh, that's street underground uh, waste uh, containers which is here from Turkey and what they are doing they're producing underground waste containers uh, which prevent garbage leak uh, liquids from leaking uh, there is data science here that uh, remote control system allow the garbage truck driver to manipulate the containers directly from the truck. So basically, a lot of sensors there, data is used and uh, we can see how, how, how the, how the uh, basically the, the sensors are signalizing uh, when the container is full. What can be also done as an improvement, basically we can do smart planning uh, if to see what kind of uh, the data science is uh, here, in, uh, uh, let's say, introduced to in terms of planning we can see which quartz are uh, filling filling up these uh, uh, containers much faster so we can we can build one more two more three more or we can see if some is not there so we know that we don't need to have any kind of uh, any kind of any kind of uh, any kind of uh, the uh, let's say changes also we can also do smart planning to see when we need to because there is a there is optimum life of every these containers, so we can optimize and predict how many new containers we need per year. For example, that's all data science that we are needed behind. Uh, and last but not the least is the Osiris system, that, which is using smart uh, street uh, lighting. And basically, this is this is something that is uh, implemented in the, as you can see, in the uh, Pakistan. And uh, in sorry in. Yeah, uh, and it's uh, basically uh, automatically uh, what is their product doing? They're automatically adapting uh, to the time of the day and user presents cut down cost and your real time demand based energy consumption. Basically on the sensors, they are uh, sending us back information. We are analyzing this data and seeing what is the optimum, optimum, optimum approach. That's, that's, that, that's part of, like I said, it's, uh, it's uh, saving from the savings from the uh, energy consumption and also everything else uh what i also wanted to say is as a few example and one of let's say uh, i think that's very cool i had it this year there's a lot of cool well, to be honest uh the uh, smart cities but i was the uh, last fall i was in a smart Vien uh, in vienna and i met, met with the person for behind the stadt vienna project of smart cities and i was totally let's say uh, uh I, I totally was adoring what they are doing some some of the things they're using well, just to mention very quickly is they're using smart buses uh, basically uh, they have more than 127 bus routes and they're optimizing this uh, uh, these uh, these routes using data science and, uh, and 
uh, they're cutting to the zero emission because they're electric buses. And basically, I think that they want some kind of price uh, for the Austrian state in mobility for 2013, 14, 15, something like that. Now, also, what they are using uh, data science and, and smart cities, they are using smart ride because they have more than 1.3 uh, thousand uh, uh, kilometers along cycle paths. And basically, uh, how they are using uh, smart cities, so they are having more than one and a half thousand bicycles so with 120 stations. Building these stations is uh, something that planning was done also with uh, help of data science and AI to, to see which routes are optimal to have the, the biggest, uh, big, uh, with the smallest effort, biggest results. Uh, also, last but not the least, is the smart public transport. It's basically because they have a, a lot of more than 800 and 50, 900 kilometers of uh, a long and wide public transportation network. Uh, and they had over almost uh, 1 billion uh, passengers uh, who commute to the city. Okay, they are the same person, but when we are talking about the, 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 the like on a daily level, when you all, all of the time. And uh, there is an application called Quando, which is a mobile app uh, that allows users to get access to real-time information on the arrival and departure of timing of the buses and this is something that is like i said this is something that can prevent the the prevent the um prevent the uh traffic jams uh, and also what can uh, save time for the citizens regarding that uh like i said the last part of uh, my uh, talk is going to focus on the on on the let's say we talk a lot a bit more how we can use, what are the clear examples, what are the usage examples of the data science advanced cities and how it can be used, what is the overwhelming, like the overwhelming the effect of the smart cities. But also let's talk a little bit more about, uh, let's say to, for me, I think this, there are the two primary problems beside money, of course, and <laughs> public perception. But let's say that we don't have a problem with money and we don't have a problem with public perception. Is that, the, the, is that enough so we don't have any kind of other issues, challenges or problems with implementing uh, uh, smart cities and data science as smart cities? The answer is no. Why? Uh, because in the first place, we have a lot of issues with data governance. Uh, what is the data governance? That is uh, basically the set of different skills, how we are using, uh, collecting, collecting, uh, storing, uh, using, analyzing, and putting in, in, in uh, business intelligence terms, uh, our data. This is something that is new to people who didn't have a chance, didn't know about it, didn't want to know about it, how to use data. Uh, it's not like to say, like I said, on some, some terms, there is a more or less uh, the data, a data organization they are used to the, to the uh, data, data governance. But like I said, the most important things are organizations in terms of who is a part of the organization. And we are talking about smart cities, uh, all of us, are a part of organization, but you know, let's say, uh, like a uh, narrow terms, people who are administrating smart cities, device, smart cities uh, projects, and people who are employed in this uh, in the local uh, local authorities policies. This is also very important to know uh, what kind of policy and how we are storing, uh, how we are using data, and uh, how we are how we are, what we are implementing, what we are collecting, etc. Data catalogs very important part because we are talking about uh, every data need to know what is the who, what is the name, what is the, what is the type of data, what are the possible values, who is collecting, who is responsible for the data. Data catalog is something that most of the time we are missing. If for the side of data scientists, we have data catalogs for every data, that's not really to happen, but if we are having, let's say, all of the data catalogs, before we start doing analyzing, uh, our job will be like not 78 times easier only, but it's going to be like, I don't know, Unbelievably, I, I cannot even like, uh, it's because it's depending on the type of the data. But for example, let's say if you're using NLP for language, uh, text to voice, it is going to be like, uh, there is, if the, there is more tokens, there's going to be 80 to 150 uh, uh, more times, uh, uh, percent, uh, percent uh, going to be a better solution. Just with having a good data catalogs. Data analytic definition is something is also that it's important thing to, to have to see okay, what kind of analytics we're going to use, why we're using, uh, is that, uh, uh, and who is going to perform, how we're going to perform, because that's also like what kind of technology 
which we are going to use behind it. Uh, data sourcing is also what is the source of the data, how we are collecting them, uh, what technology we are using behind it. Data quality and mass data is something that is also important because if there is a lot of garbage in our data. And that, that's not only people do forget that uh, we can, uh, it's about who is generating the data. In the first place, the human can generate data, but also machine can generate the data. It doesn't need to be 100% true if machine is generating the data, that is okay. Just think about one thing. What happened if the sensor is not good? Not, not broken fully, broken, not sending, but it's not collecting the full data. It needs to be changed, but we don't know that. What kind of data did the sensor send? Wrong data? Not, or not accurate data enough? That's also the problem. And the people who work in machine intelligence know about that. that people are also all, all the time think, okay, it's very hard to analyze the data on the social networks. That it's not, uh, let's say, for example, only. Uh, it's very hard to analyze the data because uh, people are not having the right, uh, right, uh, right, uh, right, uh, right uh, words using, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's also a problem. Much more generated uh, garbage data from human side. But it's not only from the human side, it's also from machine side. Uh, also, uh, the last three, the part of data operation, what kind of operation, ETL processes we are doing to get in the data. And last but not the least is data security. Very important issue, like in the last year, of the, uh, the market for data security has jumped over 10 times in one year. Expect, it's expected to have 10 times this year as well. That means in times of two years, we have like uh, the second, uh, second, uh, second, second point of value of zero, the whole amount of the market had jumped. That's something that is ludicrous. And it's and basically what is important thing to say, if there's cybersecurity engineers, data engineers, uh, data, uh, data security engineers, basically <laughs> you can just uh, uh, just use uh, this information to say, okay, I would like to have double of my value as a paycheck and feel like you will get three times because there is not enough people to just test this call. Uh, and we are talking about uh, data governance framework, uh, basically, we can use. We can also. We can also talk. Sorry. We can also talk about uh, data. This kind of framework, basically strategy, and this. We can talk about this kind of uh, different approach. So first, the question is, where does the data come from? Data lineage. Also, organization. Who is responsible for the data? Process and standards. Who is the data process? How the data is processed and calculated? Key figures and monitoring. In which business processes is data processing? Yes, technology is a solution. In which system is data stored and last communication, who used the data and where? Process report and some other things like, I don't know, some kind of, uh, I don't know, decision intelligence system that is going to help you like to choose between three most, most, most probable answer, for example, based on your knowledge and experience and expertise. So basically you can also look at this, this, like, uh, this uh, graph onto this level. And this is something that is very important to talk on the, on the places like this in a conference like this because we as a tech person sometimes we don't if we don't need to uh, to to put uh, that much tax we don't do that we are the ones who are responsible for this not some kind of i don't know hr a law uh, like a attorney or something like that to, to create these kind of policies because sometimes especially in the banks when you're talking for example they are the responsible for creating data governance structure we as a tech person are responsible for this and we are creating a system. It's much better to say, okay, we need at twice as much time to create and to be very stubborn about that because we can get that. And to say, but we need to create data governance because if you don't use these kind of things and sorry, pardon my French, is going to bite, bite our ass now in tech, 10 months or two years because we didn't do that. Why? Because at some point, a legacy system is going, everything we create is going to become legacy at one point of time or other. If you have data governance, maybe we can use AI to create everything and to solve that problem. If you don't have data governance, it's going to be possible, but much harder and much more time. So basically why organization need to govern data? Basically on the first place is to avoid inconsistent data silos in different department DB business units. What does this practically mean? That means, for example, if uh, for, uh, in, in smart city uh, approach, if we are going to have uh, and if we are uh, having like, I don't know, uh, two departments, air pollution and water pollution, they are measuring and they are having like two, two different, 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 uh, different uh, name for the same, let's say, abbreviation of uh, anomality. It can be a problem because sometimes what is, what is also happening that something that is anomality, name of the anomality in one place is, is going to 
be normal state in the second place. And we communicate these kind of things with the citizens, <laughs> it's going to be a problem because they're going to think differently. That's something that happens all the time, even in the big systems such as Bank of America, uh, I don't know, uh, Google or Facebook. This is happening all the time because the data is not governed how it should be it's very hard to do that uh, to agree on common data definition for shared understanding of data like i said to improve data quality through efforts to identify and fix error in data sets basically like i said it's very hard okay when you see there is something unlogical in data okay you fix the data and you see but sometimes when we are talking about that example what if the sensor is malfunctioning it's not broken but it's malfunctioning how do we know if it's malfunction or it's sending the good data that something is not being great in the machine on one second third or fourth case but we can use data science behind data governance to see how it's happening also to increase analytical accuracy and give decision make reliable information with good data without that much of the garbage and to be like completely honest we as a data scientist don't expect to have like 100 true data never that that's not possible like it's simply it's if you have 100 data that's synthetic data that's that's not the case we're not expecting to have like but believe it or not on some system there's like 40 percent of even more than 50 percent of garbage data inside of the data collectors because something is not was not doing right which when you have like i don't know Let's talk about bias a little bit. If we are, we are having biased information, like 60% of our data, for example, in, in the case of uh, Afro-Americans in the US, 60% of the data, I think that's estimation of bias. What kind of thing you, do you think that the machine will learn? That that bias is okay. So basically, we have, we have, we are not having wrong data, but we, have, we didn't have quality check of the data when this decision was made. Nobody has uh, said, okay, to the judges, this is a bad data, bad decision that are inside of our data going back. So accuracy of your decision is not good. So of course there is a different aspects of this. It's very simplified view, but also like I said, if we, if we have a good data, we're going to have a better, uh, better accuracy. Also to implement an enforced policy that help prevent data errors and misuse. This is very important because fraud is a, we as a human being, to be honest, like we are, we are uh, flawed. That's totally fine. We are not perfect. That's totally fine. And that's something that we need to, to, to understand that that is uh, not being perfect, not being the, the best uh, version of ourselves in every moment of our daily life or, or our routine is totally fine. But also sometimes this kind of thing can be out of, uh, let's say, outlier, out of control. It can create a lot of, lot of uh, uh, let's say, uh, harm to the, to the citizen. If we are not, for example, if we are having policy that is preventing diabetic, to, if, for example, in Serbia, we have a case that the diabetic person, 10% of our nation doesn't have a free, completely free uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare uh, uh, protection for the diabetes because they need to pay like up some amount for like one and a half time uh, of our average uh, wage is uh, the, the cost of their living in terms of uh, food and in terms of uh, additional medicines or tracking or something like that. That's that's bad. In one, to one point of other, that's going to be a problem because the, the, the health of the nation is going to be dropping down. The, we will need much more money to invest into the to, into helping these people because that's something that's a primary health health uh, health uh, health uh, prevention that every country except us have but basically what i'm saying that we need to use about that also misuse maybe some of the money already used in the abatic system is can be used in some other way because there's misusing from the sign of for pharmacy or something like that they are charging much more than they are like uh, providing to the people also the last but not the least to help ensure compliance with uh, data privacy laws and other regulation this is important part i know that uh, for example for the fact that google is trying to force the, uh, the narrative that data compliance, uh, data privacy, data compliance is not part of AI systems, uh, techniques and systems. And I know that for a fact that uh, Amazon is for that kind of definition. We need to be on the, on the, on the, on the very, very clear of this path. Everything regarding data is part of AI techniques and systems. Everybody who is making that statement that's not true, he's not he doesn't know what he's talking about that's like uh, basically uh basically saying that uh i don't know how to how to what can be a, a good a good metaphor but for example if you're saying 
yes, I'm I, I'm a chief, but I don't. Uh, but I think that uh, it's not important what kind of ingredients I'm putting inside of the of my meal. How can you be a good chief? You don't understand how how, how this is happening. So basically, this is very important to understand that everything re related to data is part of AI techniques. And basically, this is like who is the part of the program on data governance, just to explain for the people who are maybe implementing and watching this and from the side of smart, smart systems implementation, like on the first place, the chief data officer. Uh, and that's something that, that is very important to know about the smart cities. Every city should have chief data officer. Without this position, particular position, you're not smart city per se. You are not governing your data for sure on the terms how you could perform your data. You're only calling yourself a smart city. You're not smart city without chief data officer. This may be like a small thing, but this is like uh, telling to the to the whole world and whole society that you are having on the highest level. You have somebody who is in charge of data. Vienna has chief data science officer. That's like I said, I'm totally in love what Vienna is doing, not only from technology point of view, but also from the governance point of view. Uh, data conference council committee. It's very important to have a set of people inside of this data governance council. That's not only technical part, but lawyers, etc. I don't know, uh, philosophers, philosophers, or something like that. Data governance team is somebody who is uh, who, who are basically in for, uh, in charge of creating all of the systems behind and creating the team beside uh, data stewards are the somebody who are like on the lowest on, on the on the on the second lowest level who are basically uh, in charge to implement uh, governance policy and monitor the compliance with them they are not per se uh, experts in data science but they are also very important to to see if everything's happening how it should be and last but not the least the most important the part are data quality analysts and engineers. They are basically monitoring what is the quality of the of the data and who are uh, creating new new systems and uh, and improving the, uh, the the systems. It's not like something that you create one one in a lifetime and after that you are you're having the same same picture all over again. You need to uh, constantly improve improve, create new data, implement new data, see how the things is connecting and communicating, just to avoid the thing that uh, some of the programs become legacy. And last but not least, what I also want to stress about for the few minutes before I, I finish with my talk, and I think that I'm uh, running a little bit uh, behind the schedule. Sorry for that, Alexander. But uh, ethical principles, uh, they're very important. Right now, we have a, uh, a guidelines on the European level. Uh, they are implemented. Uh, also, United Nations, UNESCO has implemented ethical AI guidelines as well, which is very important to know. And basically, all of them are having seven key principles. First one is human centric uh, centricity. It's basically human in the loop. It should be like keeping human in the loop and should be oriented toward human development. Accountability, that means that the uh, principle of accountability for ethical AI is the uh, is the, that uh, we need to know who is responsible, account, uh, who we can. Uh, who is accountable for, uh, for developing the uh, AI solutions? Privacy, data privacy, data governing is something that needs to be uh, in the in the in, in in field. We need to uh, to ensure that data are secure, data are private, and we need to know that this principle is very hard to obtain in terms of at, uh, in the terms of the in terms of the uh, from the technical point of view. I'm not sure how how it can be uh, realistically implemented in terms of after that bias etc because if you don't know what kind of gender is the person and we are training model that is already biased on this and we just just leave that it's very hard to to benchmark what is a good solution i think that we, we will find solution in the next couple of years but it, 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 it is technical challenge and problem we need to solve risk awareness everybody who is developing ai solution need to be aware of the risk of i don't know if we are building a risk model for the for the uh, banks, we need to see. Uh, we need to know that we can uh, we can mess with somebody's license. He doesn't because our AI system is not good enough. Uh, that somebody can uh, have their dreams crushed. It can uh, lead even unfortunately, but sometimes even to 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 harming it, uh, uh, harming people by themselves. That that, that can be uh, realistic on some point or some percent of the cases. Compliance. Uh, what does it mean? That means that it in compliance with every every uh, every adopted law we already have. Developed cost effectiveness is also we need to, to know, and this is very interesting for the blockchain. Sorry for that. Uh, but uh, what is the cost? Is, is, is it effective? Like, uh, are we are we giving much more than we are getting back? For example, sometimes uh, access is much better. But we're talking about cost effectiveness. It's not only about 
uh, about like uh, the time needed, but also the resource needed in terms of the I don't know uh, firepower in terms of the uh, of the servers, uh, GPUs, CPUs. Uh, basically, everything of this maybe can be done much much easier and not to to to, to waste energy. And last but not the least, it needs to be re 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 uh, reliable. What does it mean? We need to like be sure that the uh, what we are getting as the answer is explainable and we know what we are doing that means that black box ai is not going to be the case in the near future so uh sorry guys for developing like a black box in terms of like products and thinking that you maybe you will be able to be competitive markets you will not because this will be forbidden in the next five years every ai solution need to be and basically if you're only competitive uh advantage to your solution because it's black box solution then means that you're doing something wrong when we are talking about building data a data and ai product especially in the smart city uh things it's about people who are implementing on the first place that's human centric on one on one view philosophical view but also it is like uh, showing that your expertise and not only like putting like three three models and training models said okay i put three lines of the code or 30 lines of the code and i'm getting the answer <laughs> basically everybody can do that yeah you just think you're not innovative if you put three different methods to get the best the best of the best uh, you are innovative if you are reduced the cost of implementation you you have uh you have feature and feature engineer the model and that's something that is a little bit that's data science and AI. not only putting three models or some visualization to be honest and uh, like I said, uh, this is the last uh, thing I would like to share with you. Uh, I would like to thank you all for the uh, for listening to me. Uh, also, I would like to invite you if you are interested in data science. Also, we're going to have some kind of uh, we are going to have some companies that are uh, working very very strong in the field of smart cities. Our present there. Uh, I would like to invite you to join us at Zagreb. Uh, right now, we have a uh, early bird prices uh, coming next in six days. Uh, is going to be very interesting. Like I said, already mentioned who's going to be a speaker. So we are going to have more than 30 speakers on the topics such as uh, data science in production, decision intelligence, uh, uh, but as well data analytics, data engineering, uh, open data, data for good, ethical AI, and also some kind of breakout session for smaller groups such as uh, data governance. Like I said, very important topic. Uh, data security, also very important topic. And last but not the least, like uh, building data and AI product. So if you're interested, you can you can contact me or you can visit the website that you can see there. Just just click at this it's a creation 22 and you will find us. And like I said, uh, sorry Alexander for being like five minutes late. Uh, I was hoping that I will be especially at port, but this is the this is the end of my presentation. Hopefully I I I wanted to just present you the whole like uh, the whole broad aspect of data science usage in, in inside and to relate to do like i said the data science and uh, data data governance and ethical as, as one of the things we need to think about when we are talking about smart cities uh dear alex thank you for this amazing presentation it was great to finally uh get this answer because this is something what i propagate and agitate for years that data science is the key foundation of smart doesn't matter we are talking about cities or at any other context, including smart factories or whatever, actually what we discussed today, and uh, we will together conclude this event uh, today. I, I really uh, hope that uh, uh, we covered uh, the triangle I used uh, in the very beginning in my talk. I think maybe you skipped uh, that part when I discussed about Internet of Things and sensing the First. place when we are collecting data. And then Professor Rukovato discussed about telecommunication infrastructure, what is actually also critical to transport this and transfer this data from the place of, of, of measuring and collecting to, to big data centers, uh, one of more in centralized or decentralized systems. And you covered a little bit about uh, also artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, uh, also three, let's say, uh, famous and popular buzzwords in, in tech world. Uh, I hope that we cover at least some of them and clarify, but the most important thing for any future discussions is to clarify the meaning of smart. And in that context, I think that your presentation was uh, the most important part of, of, of today's event. And this is just the first edition of IEEE Smart Cities Week. And as you know, we, we, we met on many Smart Cities uh, events uh, in the region. 
uh, here in Western Balkans, and I'm pretty sure that we will meet uh, maybe outside of the European continent also discussing about this. But this is really important uh, to, to, to uh, inspire people to think about of meaning smart, doesn't matter if we are talking to engineers or we are talking to non-engineering community, to legislation experts, to decision makers, to government, business industry, or academia. Uh, we all we, we really need to 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 conclude that uh, we need all of them together if we really want to create uh, uh, smart cities. Because as as I said in the very beginning, uh, cities are complex system of subsystems. And we need a lot of experts from different fields, completely multi-stakeholders multi approach to really understand and describe not only solutions, but also problems we need to face in coming years. Thank you once more. Uh, I will also invite the audience, doesn't matter people who uh, follow us in these uh, live sessions on Facebook or YouTube. I think that we had some problems and issues with live on Facebook, but I checked that uh, live on uh, YouTube is going pretty well, but doesn't matter. I will publish uh, this recorded video later with all three sessions together. And uh, the whole IT Police Smart City uh, community will, I, I'm pretty sure, will, will share this video across the world, across uh, IT Police community, but also non IT Police community. And I warmly uh, uh, commend and ask the community to ask questions. Uh, they can type to us on comments uh, below video on YouTube uh, or Facebook or any other networks and I will share with you and Professor Dan as well as uh, some questions uh, who is addressing my part, I will try to, to, to reply. So I'm pretty sure that uh, we, we clarify uh, and simplify smart cities today to push community to continue working. I also, uh, uh, once again, thank you. And I will also try and invite everybody who is able to, to attend uh, your conference in Zagreb, but also any other additions in the United States or Europe, because I know that you are working on the few, few events, full series, uh, to join this amazing community, because uh, I was following your work and I saw many amazing speakers for uh, these mm -hmm. years behind. And of course, for doesn't matter for which part of the world, we'll, somebody will watch this video later, I'm pretty sure they will find a way to, to attend and join the uh, data science community and conference. Thank you, Alex, and thanks, thanks everybody. Uh, this is uh, end, and uh, that's it for, for this year, and I hope that we meet next year celebrating the new second edition of uh, IG Police Smart Cities again. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.